So I'm going to give you just a little bit background about the organization. I think most of you know that the ECD Global Alliance has a mission to help everyone in the community from around the world. That includes medical professionals, caregivers, family members, and most of all, patients. We, we currently have about 780 ECD patients registered with the organization. They come from 65 different countries. We do our best to offer each one the help that they need, but with an organization as small as ours, we are only able to do this with the involvement and aid of you and the medical community. We thank you for all you do to help these patients and are deeply honored to do our small part to help patients find you. Here you can see the distribution of patients geographically who are registered with the organization. About half the patients are from the US, but many patients are alone in their country. So you can imagine how lonely and difficult it can be for them as they try to find someone who can provide them information about such a rare disease. For this reason, we really ask that you let your patients know about the ECDGA and encourage them to register with us. You can find registration online and in multiple languages. For those in the US, this map shows the distribution of registered patients. We believe that ECD remains an underdiagnosed disease because of the complications associated with diagnosis and limited knowledge of ECD within some medical communities. For that reason, we believe ECD awareness within the medical community is critical if patients are going to be diagnosed early in the progression of ECD. We do know that awareness of ECD and treatment options have improved since 2008 when the ECDGA was formed. You can see in this graph that the number of publications related to ECD is growing at a very good rate. We thank each of you who are responsible for these publications. We believe this is one of the best ways to raise awareness among those in the medical community who are most likely to diagnose patients. Today, I saw that PubMed has published the histiocytic NCCN guidelines and related survivorship issues. Thank you to all those who were involved with making this happen. It's a great, great accomplishment. The ECDGA currently reaches over 1,300 medical professions from professionals from around the world. We have established ECD Care Center Referral Network that includes 35 medical institutions in 13 countries. The identified physicians at these centers are committed to helping patients and providing consultation services to other physicians. In order to serve adult histio patients with the best possible care, the ECD Global Alliance continuously seeks to fill the gaps in the referral network. If you are interested in learning more about becoming a referral center, please let us know by email. Researchers interested in histiocytosis are awarded research funding annually. The ECD Global Alliance has awarded over $750,000 to research projects focusing on ECD and adult histio disorders. An annual international symposium is held each year to foster relationships, to further re collaboration, and to help improve care for patients everywhere. Next year, we hope to begin our in-person events once again in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. We will be sending out information about this in future emails. Lastly, as stated earlier, raising awareness within the medical community has been an important focus for the, for the organization. With the help of volunteers, the Alliance has participated in conference booths, organizing grand rounds, presenting at specialty conferences and more. To get involved in awareness activities, please contact us. The email where you can reach us is listed below. And for now, we want to thank you for all you do to help histiocytosis patients from around the world. So with that, we'll get started with the main portion of our meeting. And I'm going to pass uh, the baton, the mic over to 
our own Jesse Corcoran, who will be emceeing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. We're very happy to have you on. And uh, you've seen the technical slides show up at the beginning of the meeting. But if you have more questions, please just put them in the chat and we'll get with you as soon as we can. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Eli Diamond that's going to report on the patient registry next. Okay, so I'm gonna um, talk about the EC registry and then um, some results about uh, fatigue and pain um, in ECD patients. These are my disclosures. Um, so I'm going to provide an overview about the ECD registry structure um, and talk about enrollment and data um, sort of collection and analysis to date, um, mention some projects and opportunities for collaboration, um, and then um, provide one, one example of an avenue of investigation for the registry, which was um, uh, fatigue and pain in 127 registry patients. So just as a, um, as a reminder, this is, this is, this is a study that um, has been funded by the Global Alliance from a grant from many years ago. Um, subsequently, um, it has been funded from other, many other grants, um, largely philanthropic. Um, and uh, the aims are to collect, you know, comprehensive longitudinal data about ECD patients um, with um, clinical radiologic pathologic elements, um, and then with a focus on patient reported outcomes um, and other patient-centered patient metrics. Um, so the consent, um, uh, the consent is web-based, so patients can consent from anywhere. Um, uh, this is managed by our clinical research associate, Allison Sigler. Um, there is a, there's a screening, sort of a hard stop screening questions when people, um, when people uh, attempt to consent by the link. Um, and consenting includes consent to chart retrieval and review, um, scan uh, broad biobanking, uh, and then the patient reported outcomes, because not all patients are capable of doing it, we have that um, as optional. Um, uh, the clinical database is gleaned from either MSK records or external records. That's done by um, Dana, who is a clinical trials nurse in our um, histiocytosis program. Um, uh, relevant um, dates of clinical presentation, radiologic and pathologic diagnosis are collected. Um, and then from the time of diagnosis and enrollment, um, detailed information about um, symptomatology, organ dysfunction, um, and performance status are collected. The, the elements, this was many years ago, the elements of the database were, were harmonized with um, many of the other large ECD centers. So the, the, um, the elements represented in those centers sort of um, Excel sheets and databases do, do, do correspond to the ones that are in ours. Um, I, I review all of the key elements of, um, of the diagnosis to confirm that I think uh, ECD is correct. Um, and about 145 records have been uh, reviewed to date. Um, all scans are archived. We have a, there's a de-identified scan archive. The platform is called XNAD. Um, and that, that allows for, a, um, for external collaborations that others could, you know, with a, with a data transfer agreement, um, view the entire imaging archive. Um, we, we store all of the scans, but with a focus on diagnostic scans or um, extensive disease, showing um, a patient's entire extended disease. Um, the scans, we, we, we know which ones are linked in time to patient reported outcomes so that disease status can be analyzed in association um, with um, patient reported symptoms. Um, as, as a logistic matter, it is not easy, you can imagine, to obtain um, all of patients outside scan. So that's a a logistic bottleneck, um, and we do document sites of disease from, from, the, from the scan reports. Um, we do have a formal review of diagnostic and extensive disease scans, and those are with one of two um, sort of histiocytosis-focused nuclear medicine staff that we have. Um, we document for um, lesions, uh, all of the lesions and a patient's scan and whether they are measurable by either anatomic, which is to say CTMRI or PET measurability. We do a measurement. Um, there is a separate neuro form for brain and spine. And so um, this sort of renders a patient's scan amenable to follow-up and with a sort of response assessment that is 
pretty much the same as what could be used um, in a clinical trial. Uh, and then um, um, uh, we have a separate sort of, we have a separate sites of disease, which is sort of uh, vetted by this level of radiology review. Um, you may be familiar, these are just some examples of some projects that have come out of this, um, of the registry, uh, implementing this degree of, of radiology review. The top was our neurologic project with um, review of brain and spine MRIs, and then our, our, our PET study. Um, in terms of the biobanking, um, the consent covers pretty broad biobanking. We, there's no central pathology review. I mean, our, my pathology colleagues are always happy to look at a, a case if needed, but that's not formal. I, I review all the pathology reports. Um, we have a pretty large sample archive at this point um, for paraffin, sometimes fresh samples, sulfur DNA, and Buffy code. Um, and then our sequencing initiative uh, provides a mechanism for mutational testing for patients who are enrolled in the registry if that um, if that needs to be done. And then our, our collaboration with the, with the oops, our collaboration with the Israeli group is a nice example of um, a project that has come from um, from the registry and the and the biobank. Um, we capture all treatments in a very detailed fashion that, that all the patients have had. So we have a this is just an example of the red cap sheet, um, the start do, start dose, end dose, you know, start date, end date of every treatment, um, best response that was achieved um, and documented toxicities and the toxicity automatically pulls from the CTCAE. So they're, um, they're documented at that level of detail. Um, and because we have the entire treatment trajectory and the response on a certain treatment, we can correlate disease status with the um, patient reported symptoms and outcomes. Um, so I just, this is an opportunity for me to, you know, ask anyone who would like to please um, try and collaborate with, with me and the registry on, um, on projects. It is certainly not um, for me alone. I, I do have data and material transfer agreements with a couple other institutions. Um, and there is a really, there is an abundance of data. Um, and I'm really very, very pleased to support um, um, any number of registry-based projects. So, and it's a, it should be a resource for everyone. So please reach out to me about that. Um, we do have a companion caregiver study that I just want to mention, um, which is studying um, needs and experience of ECD caregivers. The caregivers are linked to registry patients so that um, patient disease factors and symptoms can actually be analyzed together with, um, with caregiver needs. Um, and uh, we did we did publish a pilot study about uh, the burden for ECD caregivers uh, in the last couple of years. So just to to focus on what um, uh, one one sort of uh, early study that we've done from the registry um, from our first uh, paper from the registry about symptoms. Basically, the, the the two most common reported symptoms by ECD patients are fatigue and pain. Um, uh, fatigue was reported by 72% of, uh, of the 50 that we first reported, and then various kinds of pain were reported very frequently. Um, so the um, uh, two of the patient reported outcomes instruments that are completed are the BFI, the brief fatigue inventory, and the brief pain inventory. Um, and these are um, very well-traveled um, evaluations of self-reported pain and fatigue. Um, they have um, nine, the BFI has nine and the BPI have, um, they have 11 items, that, sorry, nine and 11 respectively that are scored from zero to 10. Um, and so for each, there is a, a subscore for severity of pain for, or end fatigue for how much pain or fatigue interferes with life. And then there's a total score um, in, in alignment with other studies in this literature. Um, we defined um, clinically relevant fatigue or pain as having any item uh, with, with the score being four or above, which is moderate to severe. And then we looked um, uh, with um, univariate and with a recursive partitioning analysis, whether um, various clinical factors such as age, age sites of disease, prior therapies, um, treatment, and then other comorbidities, whether those were associated with any, um, with any uh, degree of severity or frequency of fatigue. Although, you know, really one of the main things that I wanted to do in this study was actually just get a sense of how common and severe uh, these are for the patients. Um, so this is the 
these are the kinds of elements of fatigue that are measured by the BFI. Um, those are the nine items. Um, and then those are the items that are, um, that are measured for pain. Um, so this is, um, we, uh, there was 127 patients that were analyzed. That was just at the, the data cut, time cut that we, that we did this for. Um, you can see this is sort of a typical ECD uh, distribution, but 60% men. Um, and the median mean age at the time of diagnosis in the 50s. Um, the, um, the length of undiagnosed illness was about two years. Um, and you can see the sites of disease. Almost everyone has bone. Um, many have neurologic. Um, and then the sites of disease, you can see the uh, mutational status sort of distribution, lines of prior therapy, um, and then um, the different treatments that the patients are on. So this is the, these are the results for the entire brief fatigue inventory. Um, and you can see in red, the number and percentage of patients with either moderate or severe um, fatigue in all of those different dimensions. Um, as you can see, it's very, it's very high. Um, and you know, altogether, 72% um, of the participants had clinically relevant overall fatigue. 62% uh, had clinically relevant interference owing to fatigue, and 70% had um, clinically relevant um, fatigue severity. So it's a very um, kind of a sobering number. Um, in terms of pain, um, still very frequent, not, not to the extent of fatigue, but you know a substantial number of, um, of participants reporting moderate or severe pain. And just to digest it for you, 50% uh, had clinically relevant overall pain, 46% had interference due to pain, and 46% had um, clinically relevant pain severity. Um, if we look at the intercorrelation between uh, pain and fatigue, uh, the top is a Spearman correlation, which is correlating the severity. Um, so pain and fatigue um, severity are themselves very, very, very tightly intercorrelated. Um, and then the presence or absence of clinically relevant pain and cl cl clinically relevant fatigue is also very, very, um, they're, they're significantly associated. Um, and in, insofar as I've talked about this with patients in focus groups and what have you, they themselves have always been the first people to say that fatigue and pain um, go together. Um, which you know wasn't always intuitive to me, but I think that that, that bears out uh, very strongly. Um, in terms of associated factors with fatigue, so it was in many ways a negative finding um, in the sense that there was no uh, there was no association between the presence of clinically relevant fatigue and age, um, how long patients had had ECD. You know, I thought maybe brain involvement, they would have more fatigue, number of disease sites, um, BRF status, comorbidities, um, the RPA cutoff, there was no RPA cutoffs for this. Um, the only thing that came out in the wash was um, the fact that patients who've had more than two lines of prior therapy um, had more, um, more frequent clinically relevant interference uh, related to fatigue. I mean, this is a, it's a cross-sectional study. So the patients are all at different points in their tr disease trajectory, you know, and it's one time point, but um, not much came out in the wash for that. Um, when it comes to pain, interestingly, there was a very clinically, very um, statistically significant set of um, RPA cutoffs for um, clinically relevant overall pain, where um, patients who were younger, younger than the age of 70, who had a longer duration of ECD, um, had anemia, interestingly, um, and um, had treatments other than either low or intermittent targeted therapies, um, had uh, uh, more frequent um, overall clinically relevant pain. And I can show you the, this is the RPA cutoff here. So, um, you know, patients older than 70, uh, you know, 8% had clinically relevant pain, um, you know, whereas uh, patients who were younger had a longer duration of illness, um, you know, uh, and who were anemic had a more had 76% had um, clinically relevant pain. So this is the RPA here. There isn't a, there isn't a, you know, overwhelming clinical rationale that you can think of for these, although you could, you could think through it to a degree. Um, and so um, in summary, I hope 
Um, hope you'll see that the, the registry is a, a very multi-platform sort of usable database with lots of avenues of investigation and collaboration. Um, fatigue and pain are you know, massively frequent and severe. Um, you know, to me, I think the negative finding of the fact that these things appear completely unmodified by treatment or disease status, I mean, that resonates with my experience that these are two things, especially fatigue, that it doesn't feel like there's much that we're able to do to make those much better. Um, fatigue and prior therapies, you know, and generally prior therapies for us means, you know, chemotherapy or immunosuppression since targeted therapies generally come later. So I don't know whether you know, fatigue is the is the footprint of those prior treatments. Um, um, younger patients with longer disease duration may be at risk for more frequent pain, um, and perhaps you know low or intermittent dosing of targeted therapy may be more favorable. But uh, this is the kind of thing that I think is very amenable um, to further or longitudinal study. And this is our this is part of the team. Um, and for analysis of the PROs, I'm I'm very thankful to my colleagues and in biostatistics. And I will stop and take questions. Thank you very much, Eli. We have plenty of time for questions. Great. If anyone has questions about the registry, we hope that you will contact Dr. Diamond or you can contact us so we can get you in touch with their uh, registry team at MSK. Thank you very much, Dr. Diamond. It was very, very informative. You're welcome. Next, we'll have our basic science section. And first up is Dr. Giulio Cavalli. So um, I'm Giulio Cavalli, I'm the PhD. I'm an immunologist based at San Raffaele Hospital and University in, in Milan, um, Italy. I'd like to thank uh, Katie as a representative of the UCDGA and the scientific committee for having me over to, uh, to present this talk entitled Oncogene induced maladaptive activation of trained immunity in the pathogenesis and treatment of uh, Erdine Chester disease. So let's get to it. Um, ECD uh, is a rare inflammatory myeloid neoplasm characterized by infiltration of multiple tissues with foamy, lipid laden macrophages. And these cells typically exhibit uh, activating mutations along the MAP kinase pathway typically BRAF V600D, most commonly BRAF V600D, as well as continuous and rampant production of pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. And this dual neoplastic inflammatory nature of ECD has long fascinated scientists. However, uh, the mechanistic link connecting the oncogenic mutation and inflammatory activation um, has, has remained uh, uh, undetermined. Trained immunity, is a pro-inflammatory cell program that is physiologically elicited in monocytes and macrophages upon sensing of some uh, pathogens and which results in enhanced uh, production of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the event of subsequent uh, infections. Mechanistically, it is characterized by changes in cell energy metabolism, including increased glycolysis, increased glutaminolysis through the TCA cycle and increased cholesterol synthesis as well as changes in the epigenetic landscape of the cell, such as trimethylation of lysine 4 or acetylation of lysine 27 on the promoters of genes encoding cytokines, which results in uh, enhanced and stronger transcription of these uh, genes. Now, trained immunity clearly evolved as an immune mechanism to provide protection against repeated infections. However, maladaptive activation of trained immunity in the absence of infection, perhaps caused uh, by an oncogenic mutation, can result in the development of uh, inflammatory diseases. And we started forming this hypothesis that BRAF e 600 d or activation of the MAP kinase pathway might result in activation of trained immunity in, in ECD. And there were a number of observations substantiating this uh, hypothesis, and particularly a number of striking functional phenotypic similarities between macrophages in ECD and those activating trained immunity programs. Particularly, both cells um, undergo morphologic changes leading to a large size and a foamy appearance. The cytokine secretion pattern, the secretory phenotype of the two cells is pretty much overlapping and both rely on activation of the MAP kinase pathway. So 
the hypothesis that is central to the study is that maladaptive activation of trained immunity might act as the missing link between oncogenic mutation and the inflammation in, in ECD. Now, um, to test this hypothesis, we had to, uh, to tackle um, a technical issue and the fact that uh, being ECD a particularly rare disease, it is very impractical to conduct studies um, on primary cells obtained from, from patients. And thereby we developed a model uh, to recapitulate the pathogenesis of ECD in vitro based on lentiviral transduction of BRAF B600E into healthy human monocytes obtained from the bafficles of healthy donors. So monocytes were either left untransduced or transduced with wild type BRAF, which provides an essential control to ensure that whatever observed effect is not simply due to BRAF overexpression or transduced with BRAF B600E. And of note, this vector also encodes GFE, which allows, enables tracking of transfected cells, either with microscopy or uh, with fax. Now, using this model, we were able to recapitulate the main uh, genetic, phenotypic, and functional features of ECD macrophages in vitro. Um, first, macrophages in ECD uh, exhibit constitutive activation of the MAP kinase pathway. Uh, as determined, for example, by constitutive phosphorylation of the downstream kinase ERK. And uh, this finding was recapitulated in macrophages transfected with uh, BRAF uh, b 600 d at Western blot studies. Second, uh, macrophages expressing BRAF b 600 d um, in ECD lesion exhibit a large size and foamy appearance and an increase in cytoplasm and lipid uh, content as determined by oil redox staining, for example. And all these findings were recapitulated progressively upon uh, transfection of BRAF B600D also in vitro in our model. Macrophages in ECD lesions exhibit a spontaneous and abundant production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this is a capacity that they retain once they are isolated from ECD uh, lesions. And sure enough, macrophages expressing BRAF B600D upon transfection uh, started producing spontaneously uh, IL-6, TNF-alpha, as well as other cytokines. Um, finally, we also conducted RNA sequencing studies on macrophages transduced with BRAF b 600 d as well as in parallel on ECD uh, lesion biopsies. Um, and we found that the global gene expression profile was uh, remarkably overlapping and particularly enriched in uh, pathways, uh, in pro-inflammatory pathways or in pathways concerning um, immunometabolic activation. So all in all, this first set of findings um, indicates that macrophages expressing ectopic uh, BRAF b 600 d upon transduction exhibit constitutive activation of the MAP kinase pathway. Uh, they undergo progressive transformation into foamy macrophages with a large lipoplasm and cytoplasm. Uh, they exhibit spontaneous and abundant production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, as well as activation of pro-inflammatory and metabolic transcriptional programs. Thereby, this uh, in vitro model effectively recapitulates the genetic, phenotypic, and functional features of uh, ECD uh, macrophages. Now that we have established the validity of uh, this model, we are back to testing our original hypothesis that maladaptive activation of trained immunity uh, induced by BRAF b 600 d might lead to this excess inflammatory activation. Um, and now we were, uh, we sought to determine the immunometabolic and the epigenetic and functional changes characteristic of trained immunity in macrophages expressing BRAF b 600 d Starting off with the uh, metabolic changes, I wanna um, just uh, quickly remind you that this include increased glycolysis, increased glutaminolysis and cholesterol synthesis. Um, we first used the Western blot studies as well as the live cell metabolic assay C or SPLAX analyzer um, to uh, determine constitutive activation of the AKT mTOR if one alpha pathway in macrophages expressing BRAF excess energy, as well as downstream induction of uh, uh, glycolysis. And then we subjected um, our macrophages to broader metabolomic studies. And as you can see um, in, in these uh, right panels, 
the metabolom, the global metabolome of macrophages expressing BRAF disease under G uh, clustered independently from controls, indicative of a profound metabolic rewiring. And this was particularly re relevant uh, in pathways um, concerning uh, trained immunity, such as glycolysis, TCA cycle, um, which is uh, basically glycolysis and fatty acid uh, synthesis. When I sought to determine the uh, epigenetic changes characteristic of trained immunity in, in macrophages expressing BRAF disease under D, these changes include trimethylation of lysine 4 and acetylation of uh, lysine uh, 27 on the promoters of genes encoding cytokines. And we were able to determine uh, these, these changes using chromatin immune precipitation PCR. And then we observed the a functional counterpart to these epigenetic changes leading to enhanced transcription of the pro-inflammatory genes, which is enhanced uh, production of pro-inflammatory cytokines upon LPS uh, challenge. And this hyper-responsiveness to pro-inflammatory stimuli is the functional hallmark of uh, trained immunity. So the second uh, set of finding indicates that macrophages expressing uh, BRAF disease under D exhibit the main uh, and all marked features of trained immunity, particularly immunometabolic changes, including cleat glycolysis, glutaminolysis through the TCA cycle and cholesterol synthesis. The epigenetic uh, uh, changes indicative of trained immunity, trimethylation of lysine 4 and acetylation of lysine 27 on the promoters of genes encoding cytokines, as well as this hyper-responsiveness to uh, inflammatory uh, triggers and enhanced cytokine production. Now, we have established that um, macrophages expressing BRAF disease under D um, activate features indicative of trained immunity, but what does all this amount to from a therapeutic and translational uh, perspective? It amounts to quite a bit, it turns out. First, we found that effective therapeutic strategies used clinically to treat ECD, such as vimorafidine, effectively contrast this maladaptive trained immunity phenotype. For example, um, FDG PET reveals an intense uptake of glucose by ECD lesions, which is consistent with increased uh, glycolysis by infiltrating macrophages. Uh, and, mac and, uh, and patients typically also exhibit um, increase the circulating levels of cytokines. Treatment with vimorafenib results in metabolic shutdown of lesions, as well as in parallel, um, a decrease in circulating cytokines, thus substantiating a link between metabolic activation and inflammatory activation in ECD patients. We next also conducted um, studies with the bioreactor technology which um, enables long-term 3D culture of tissue biopsies obtained for diagnostic purposes, which were cultured in the presence or absence of MAP kinase pathway inhibitors. Then the tissue was retrieved and subjected to metabolomic studies. And we found that the immunometabolic changes characteristic of trained immunity also occur in ECD lesions in vivo, and they are effectively reverted by MAP kinase pathway inhibition. So finally, we wanted to determine whether um, inhibition of immune metabolism with potential um, drugs or, 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 or prospective uh, therapeutic agents might uh, abate or suppress cytokine production in ECD. We screened multiple compounds uh, and we found that the glycolysis inhibitor 2-deoxyglucose, 2-DG, uh, suppresses cytokine production to an extent that is comparable to uh, vimorafenib uh, in, in vitro. So um, in conclusion, this study indicates that um, oncogene-induced maladaptive activation of trained immunity is uh, a feature of uh, uh, macrophages in ECD. Uh, the BRAF uh, because it's under the oncogene induces immunometabolic epigenetic changes leading to enhanced cytokine production. And most importantly, this is something that is potentially therapeutically actionable as immunometabolic inhibitors are being uh, developed to treat uh, a variety of conditions and might complement uh, currently available therapies for the treatment of uh, uh, ECD. And of course, um, follow-up studies are, are, uh, are required to develop this concept into uh, potentially effective therapeutics. Now, for more details, I, uh, I'd like to refer you to this paper, Oncogene-Induced Maladaptive Activation of Trained Immunity in the Pathogenesis of Treatment of the of uh, ECD, which my research group uh, very recently published in blood, was really 
the work of two postdocs, Raffaella Molteni and uh, uh, Riccardo Diavasco. And uh, beyond those two individuals, I'd like to thank a number uh, of other people who uh, made a, an invaluable contribution uh, to this project, uh, particularly other members of Sara Fele, such as Marina Ferrarini or Elisabetta Ferrero, Professor Claudio Leoni, uh, Lorenzo Dania, who directs the clinical unit where we um, see uh, ECD patients, as well as international collaborators at University of Colorado, Denver, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, Mihai Netia is the discoverer of the strain immunity concept and it was uh, um, fundamental to have him on board, as well as Juliana Roche from Paris who contributed his expertise and clinical uh, data to the manuscript. I'd like to thank uh, our national and international sponsors supporting research in our laboratory, um, the ECDGA, and, and again, Kathy as a representative for the uh, continuing and enduring support to the community um, of uh, patients and physicians dealing with ECD. And then you all for your attention and I'm glad to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Cavalli. We do have a question in the q and I will let you read that question out from Dr. Astrid. Did lentiviral transduction with B or D coding sequence affect the degree of apoptosis upon fire in vitro culture? Uh, yes, to some extent. Uh, so it doesn't affect uh, uh, proliferation, something that, uh, that uh, we specifically checked, um, but uh, cells transduced with B-Raphic system V have the tendency uh, to survive longer in culture. So if we extend this culture beyond uh, the six to seven days, which is something that we did in the fine tuning phase, um, we found that macrophages expressing bureaucracies under the have a survival um, advantage compared to the native uh, um, counterparts. Thank you very much. Astrid, if you have any follow-up questions, you can place them in the chat as well. We have uh, a couple of answered questions from Dr. Diamond as well in, in the Q&A. If you'd like to go back and read over those, he's posted some information on um, the, the legal issues that may come with the registry for, um, for consent and things like that. If you have any more questions, please place them there. We are gonna actually take a few minutes to, oh, we have another question coming up. I see a question. I'm not sure whether it's the same that you're referring to, but my question is, do you see a link between the oncogen-induced senescence phenotype described for LCH and the oncogen-induced uh, maladaptive activation of trend immunity in ECD? Uh, this is a very interesting question. So we have, um, there was a, a big uh, nature medicine paper by the group of uh, uh, Miriam Murad describing oncogen-induced senescence in LCH. Um, our group also published a Nature Communications uh, paper describing the exact same uh, um, phenotype uh, in, um, in, uh, in an isocytosis uh, um, in vivo model. My personal view uh, is that at least to some great extent, uh, oncogen-induced senescence and uh, trained immunity are, are very similar, at least when they occur in, uh, uh, in macrophages, of course, uh, um, of course, uh, this is my hypothesis, something that should be uh, formally, formally proven by evaluating markers of senescence in um, trained macrophages and, and vice versa. But I think there is a huge degree of overlap and it may very well be one of those situations when uh, different people give different names to roughly the same phenomenon. Thank you. We also have another question in the Q&A about uh, a specific therapy. Okay, um, looking forward to it. Uh, do you think it will be relevant to consider hypomethylation therapy with azacitidine, the citabine in refractory ECD, or could it be relevant to test in your system? Well, I would definitely start off uh, with my system. I have to say I'm not um, an oncologist or a hematologist myself, so I have um, I'm not very familiar to this um, therapeutic, uh, therapeutic regimen, uh, but I'm definitely available to test it in vitro before, um, before uh, moving it to, um, to human evaluation, especially since uh, our, our model, I hope I 
persuaded you that is um, very, very relevant to what uh, actually happens in vivo. Of course, our model only uh, investigated uh, macrophages, which uh, myeloid cells, which are uh, the essence of our study and, uh, and uh, the, res the, the ones who are affected by uh, trained immunity. But uh, I think it's a, it's a good starting point. Thank you. Um, Astra did have a follow-up question in the chat, Dr. Cavalli. Um, Astrid, okay. I just want to remark that we observed the reverse of when exposing B cells to retroviral transduction with B or AFI 600D, encoding retroviral construction. Could increased survival of macrophages perhaps be induced by growth factors signaling um, via the MAP kinase pathway? Uh, it is a possibility, but it is uh, absolutely not something that we looked into uh, specifically. It's interesting that you observed the reverse um, with, uh, with B cells. And, and perhaps uh, this is something that is worth uh, um, discussing um, personally and um, perhaps to plan some, some dedicated experiments. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if Beth, I, I'm not sure what question Beth is asking, but she does have something about CNS penetration in the Q&A section. Um, okay, someone who has uh, who is uh, more more uh, proficient uh, in uh, hypermethylating therapies than I am uh, suggested that these drugs have no CNS penetration, and so perhaps uh, they're not uh, the best candidate for treatment of ECD or at least ECD with uh, uh, neurological involvement. If I understand this correctly. Okay, we'll just take a quick break. If you have any more questions that come up, you can put those into the Q&A at any point in the meeting. Uh, we'll just take a few minutes before we uh, get to Dr. Jerome that's next so that we can keep the meeting on time. Thank you. Okay, everyone, thank you for uh, staying online with us during our break. We're going to continue with our basic science talks. And next up we have Dr. Jerome Rezina Mayri. Okay, uh, so um, I'm uh, Jérôme Rezanamayri. Uh, I uh, work in uh, Dijon University Hospital, and uh, it's a pleasure to talk uh, about uh, a work uh, called Discordance, Disturbance of Monocyte Homeostasis in Histocytosis is close to CMML and uh, correlated with phenotype and disease activity. Uh, so this is the plan of the presentation with background, the purpose, the material methods, the result, uh, the discussion, and the conclusion. So uh, for the background, uh, we know that uh, histocytosis uh, are a group of orphan disease. It's caused by proliferation and uh, accumulation of uh, monocyte macrophage lineage cell into tissues, especially dendritic cell. Uh, regarding to the cell's origin, it's uh, come from uh, hematopoietic stem cell, uh, fetal liver, and yolk sac. Uh, recently, it has been shown that there is occurrence of uh, MAP kinase gene mutation, especially BRAF, uh, in stem cell progenitor, and uh, the mutation uh, mostly occurs in CD14 monocytes, as uh, it had been showed uh, on this uh, paper on uh, blood. Uh, we also know that uh, there is a cytokine and chemokine network in the blood patients uh, and lesions of patients, uh, mainly in ECD, and uh, there is an inflammatory component uh, on um, the tissue of patients, most, mostly mediated by Th1 and the Th17 uh, pathway. So there is a dual connection between uh, inflammatory and the clonal component in the monocyte macrophage lineage in patients with histocytosis. And uh, we also uh, know um, that uh, in patients with ECD, there is a decrease of non-classical monocytes resembling CMML, uh, which has been showed by uh, Matthias Papo recently on this paper on IRD. But uh, little is known about uh, monocyte homeostasis in histocytic disorder, and uh, we don't know the difference with other myeloid neoplasm or other uh, inflammatory disorder. 
So uh, we have compared a monocyte subset distribution between patients with histocytosis, uh, with patients with CMML, which is an heterogeneous group um, of um, yellow dysplastic neuroproliferative overlapping disorder, which uh, um, can have a, a map kinase uh, pathway gene involvement as a uh, histocytosis, uh, we choose uh, essential thrombocytemia as an homogeneous restricted neuroproliferative group. We took patients with uh, GCA, which is a T-mediated cell vasculitis, and we also took lc uh, We want to compare uh, the subset. The secondary outcome, uh, we wanted to see if some intrinsic factor like the type of histocytosis, the mutational status, the association with clonal hematopoietis or myeloid ne neoplasm or target therapy treatment could modulate uh, monocyte homeostasis. And we also want to see if some environmental factor as uh, systemic inflammation, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor production, or lipid abnormalities could also modulate uh, the monocytes. So um, we took blood sample from patients uh, follow in Dijon University Hospital from 2020 to uh, 2021. Uh, the histology was uh, reviewed by an expert, Jean-Francois Emile, in uh, Ambroise Paré Hospital. All patients had a full NGS on tissue biop biopsy if they were uh, BRAF wild type. Uh, patients also had bone marrow analysis for clonal hematopoiesis, and they had a complete uh, biological test. Uh, for uh, the control group, we took patients uh, with CMML, uh, essential thrombocytopenia, patients with GCA uh, with monocyte phenotyping, and volunteer LC donor. So uh, this is the flowchart of the study. So um, at the beginning, we have 20 23 suspected histocytosis, 7 CMML, uh, 10 suspected uh, essential thrombocytemia, 45 GCA, and 21 uh, LC donor. After exclusion, uh, we are the final cohort of 17 patients with histocytosis, 7 CMML, 7 essential uh, thrombocytemia, 21 GCA, and 21 LC donor. Uh, when we look at the group of uh, histocytosis, we've got uh, eight patients with ECD with uh, five BRAF mutation, five patients with uh, LCH with two BRAF mutation, four uh, rosette of man disease with uh, two MAP2K1 mutation, three patients had uh, histocytosis with myeloid neoplasm. There was uh, one CMML and two ET in ACD patients. And uh, there was uh, six patients with uh, concomitant clonal hematopoietis. It was uh, four ACD patients, one ARDD, uh, and one LCH. And uh, as I told you, uh, there is seven CMML, seven ET, 21 GCA, from whom seven had uh, aortic involvement, and uh, 21 LC donor. So uh, this is the patient characteristic uh, with uh, histocytosis, as I told you, patient with ECD, uh, with uh, all patients had uh, bone marrow analysis. Uh, there is um, the therapy that they receive, uh, the therapy that they uh, have at the time of the dosage, and uh, the disease activity using uh, the PERSIS criteria with um, uh, with um, the PET scanners. So uh, if you look at the comparison between group, uh, we use the cruise call uh, Wallis test with a dune comparison uh, when there was more than two group and the Madden Whitney test for two group. Uh, what we saw is that patient with histocytosis were younger than CMML and ET. Uh, the hemoglobin level was higher uh, in patients with uh, histocytosis compared to CMML and GCA. Uh, platelet counts uh, was uh, lower in histocytosis compared to essential thrombocytopenia. Uh, and uh, the CRP level uh, was lower in patients with histocytosis compared to ET and GCA.
uh, we also showed that uh, uh, the triglyceride level was higher in patients with histocytosis uh, compared to uh, ET. Uh, so this is uh, really the focus of interest, uh, the monocyte. So when we look at the monocyte distribution uh, regarding the monocyte count, uh, it was uh, for the total monocyte count, it was lower in histocytosis compared to CMML. And then uh, if you look at the different subsets, uh, the classical monocytes, uh, it was uh, lower in patients with ET compared with histocytosis. Uh, regarding to the intermediate monocytes, it was lower in histocytosis compared to both ET and GCA. And uh, if you look at the non-classical monocytes, uh, it is uh, lower in histocytosis compared to LC donor. So uh, if we really look at the different subset, we see that the distribution of uh, monocytes seems close uh, to CMML in the histocytosis group. Uh, as I told you uh, in the introduction, um, a recent study showed that there was a MAP kinase involvement in the monocyte uh, of patients with CMML. So uh, we've compared uh, the monocyte of patients with CMML with patients uh, with uh, both MAP kinase uh, mutation and histocytosis and patients with uh, clonal hematopoietic uh, hematopoiesis, sorry, and um, histocytosis. And what we saw uh, on all the, um, the subset monocyte counts, classical monocyte, intermediate monocyte, and non-classical monocyte, is that there is difference between CMML and histocytosis with clonal hematopoiesis, but there is no uh, difference between patients with MAP kinase uh, mutation and histocytosis and CMML. Then uh, we have compared uh, the distribution um, between the different type uh, of histocytosis, and uh, it was similar in patients with ECD, LCH, and RDD. And uh, I don't show you the data, but uh, there was no difference uh, in the subset if patients had um, BRAF mutations, MAP kinase uh, pathway mutation, uh, association with uh, clonal hematopoiesis, or um, uh, myeloid neoplasm and uh, target therapy exposure. Uh, then uh, we tried to look at the different uh, type of um, monocyte distribution according to the phenotype of the patients. And uh, what we saw uh, is that uh, in our court, there, there is a total of six patients with vascular involvement. Five of them uh, was patient with ECD. And um, there is a decrease of uh, non-classical monocyte in patients with vascular involvement compared to patients who had no vascular involvement. And then uh, we tried to look uh, if uh, it was correlated with um, the, the metabolic response. So uh, for the classification of the responder, uh, we um, classify patient with response if there is a partial metabolic response or complete metabolic response uh, and patients with no response if uh, they have stable metabolic disease or progressive metabolic disease. And uh, what we uh, show and what is seen in our court is that patients with uh, metabolic response has lower amounts of uh, intermediate monocytes, and uh, it's correlated uh, with uh, C-reactive protein levels. Uh, after that, uh, we uh, perform a logistic linear regression model using the type of histocytosis, uh, hemoglobin count, one count cell, neutrophil count, lymphocyte count, C-reactive protein level, uh, VEGFE, and uh, all lipid abnormalities. And uh, we uh, didn't find uh, that uh, any of the different um, factor had influence on uh, monocyte homeostasis. Um, so 
for the discussion, there is some uh, limits of the study. Uh, this is a small court, especially for patients with LCH and ARDD. Uh, for a facility, uh, we analyze uh, circulating cell uh, with not correlation on the monocyte on a bone marrow niche environment. Uh, we didn't have a group of naive versus treated patients and uh, we don't have yet a functional analysis of uh, the different subset of monocytes in uh, the different group. Uh, the major strength of the, stu the study is a comparison of the monocyte distribution between histiocytic disorder and both homogeneous and heterogeneous myeloproliferative neoplasm. Uh, we also have a comparison with uh, T-cell mediated vasculitis uh, with um, TH1, TH17 um, involvement as described in ECD. We've got uh, bone narrow analysis with NGS uh, for uh, clonal hematopoiesis for all patients and uh, all uh, biopsy specimen were uh, reviewed uh, for the MAP kinase by two mutations. So um, there is uh, an answer question and a further direction uh, about study of monocytes. Uh, we will try to evaluate on a prospective study uh, if the monocyte subset distribution and the change could be uh, correlated with a PET CT and could be a marker of disease activity. Uh, we will try to see if uh, target therapy treatment could modulate uh, monocyte subset distribution with uh, some dosage before and after uh, target therapy treatment. Uh, we will try to perform a deep functional analysis of monocytes in uh, histiocytic disorder compared to other myeloid neoplasm. And um, the question that uh, we don't know is that the absence of influence of intrinsic or, or extrinsic factor may question of the role of trained immunity, not only in ECD, but uh, in all histiocytic disorder. So uh, to conclude, uh, the monocyte subset distribution seems homogeneous in uh, patients with histiocytic disorder. It's close to CMML. It's different from ET and GCA. It could be useful to assess vascular phenotype and it could be a surrogate marker of uh, disease activity. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I want to thank uh, all my team uh, in the internal medicine and clinical immunology in Dijon University Hospital, the people of the Cytometry Platform Lab, uh, all the collaborators in the PTSL Petri Hospital, especially uh, Julien Roche and Fleur cohen -Aubar, and uh, pathology department of uh, Ambroise Paré, especially Jean-François Emile, and uh, all the patients and uh, the ECD Global Alliance to let me uh, talk about my work. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are glad to have you today. We do have one question in the Q&A. Yeah. How did you define the CHIP and phenotype? Uh, yeah, so uh, CHIP was the presence of uh, mutation described uh, in the myeloid neoplasm uh, on the marrow analysis. Uh, but uh, if you look at the... Um, the, the bone marrow analysis, there was no signs of uh, myelodysplastic or uh, myeloproliferative disorder. If there are no more questions, we are right on time. And we can go ahead and uh, prepare the next video. We've actually had Dr. Oyama is uh, covering the novel recurrent mutations. We did a recording for his session. So that recording will play next. Thank you, Dr. Rezin Mary. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak today. I'm Yu Oyama, and I'm in the Hematology and Oncology Department of the University of Tokyo. Today, I'd like to talk about polyxone sequencing and polygamous sequencing for ECD. Recently, target therapies have great efficacy for many ECD patients, but treatment for Patients without typical driver mutations are often difficult due to lack of specific target. Besides, in treatment for other cancer like melanoma, BRAF or MEC inhibitors are supposed to develop secondary cancer. In addition to that, there are no curative therapy for ECD. 
Thus, new target of judgment for ECD is needed. This is an oncoprod published previously. Collection sequencing for 27 cases and target sequencing for 73 cases were done. Almost a half of patients had BRAF 3600 e mutation. Although they detected driver kinase mutations in many patients, four patients have no known driver mutation. So, we decided to conduct nationwide survey with new generation sequencing for ECD patients in Japan to detect novel driver mutations and new target of treatment. We conducted nationwide survey for ECD in Japan and collected clinical information about 54 ECD patients. We reported a part of this survey in 2018. We collected samples from ECD patients and performed polyxone sequencing or polygenome sequencing for 21 samples of 14 ACD cases. This is characteristics of the 14 patients. Mean of age at diagnosis is 48 years old. Most patients had bone region and little peritoneal involvement including kidney region. One patient developed hematologic malignancy and four patients had CNS involvement. One patient was diagnosed as mixed histiocytosis. We performed polyxone sequencing for samples of ECD regions at diagnosis. The left uncle plot shows driver kinase mutations, including BRAC V600E and RASQ61R and MAF2K1C121S. These point mutations are validated in previous reports. On the other hand, the right oncoprot is about 7 patients without validated driver mutations. This shows possible driver mutations and recurrent point mutations in these cases. FF2 P786L, MIBPC3 P798N, TDRD P115L, SAT4 R102C, and TC4 F70L are recently found. Mutations in MAP3K1, RAF1, AKT1, and MAPK7 might be a driver mutation in each case, but mutation side of these genes are not reported in ECD cases. Notably, FA2P786L mutation is mutually exclusive with cases in which validated possible driver mutations are detected. This table shows the profiles of five recurrent mutations. In this, F2 is a receptor tracing kinase, and P786L mutation for in the kinase domain. Thus, we focus on F2 P786L mutation. F2 Ephrine type A receptor 2 is reported to be highly expressed in diverse cancers, and its expression is associated with poor prognosis and elevated metastatic potential. Its mutation is suggested to be oncogenic in squamous cell lung cancer and malignant pleural metacellioma. On the other hand, FA2 is also reported to work with some immunoceptor and trigger the production of pro-inflammatory mediators in response to some infectious disease. In summary, FA2 is associated with cancer progression and inflammation. As you know, MAPK pathway and PI3K AKT pathway have crucial role in ECD. FA2 rates closely to both of these pathways. Hyperactivation in MAPK pathway upregulates FA2 depending on phosphorylated ARC, and hyperactivation in PI3K AKD pathway evokes redundant independent activation of FA2. Regarding histocytosis, previous polls show that FA2 is upregulated in immature monocytes in LCS cases. Thus, it is possible that F2 plays a role in ECD pathogenesis by its oncogenicity and production of pro-inflammatory mediators. 
We think FA2P786 and mutation as a candidate of new driver kinase mutation in ECD and undertake functional analysis presently. Now, I'd like to turn to another topic. ECD is a systemic disease, and some reports show associations between sites of regions and prognosis. For example, CNS, lung, and retroperitoneal involvement are suggested as predictors of poor prognosis. We think mutated genes associated with these organs might be new targets of treatment. We thought organ-specific mutations might exist in ECD, but we could not detect organ-specific mutations in this analysis. Further analysis of more ECD cases needed to detect organ-specific mutational profile. As for now, we performed new generation sequencing for multiple organ regions of one patient, and I like to show the result of them. To begin with, I talk about clinical course of the case. She was a 57 years old woman. She was diagnosed as ECD with bone biopsy when she was 49 years old. She was first treated with interferon alcohol, but discontinued due to a side effect. Seven years after, she suffered from myelodysplastic syndrome. She was treated with two cycles of azacidine, but it was not effective. Subsequently, she developed acute mild leukemia and treated with two cycles of imitamidocytrapine. Although she reached complete response, she suffered from thrombocytopenia. On day 19 of the second cycle of starving, she had a cerebral stroke and subsequently suffered subarachnoid hemorrhage. She died and we undergo the C. We collect samples discovered here and perform fluorescent sequencing or whole genome sequencing. This is an uncle part of the case. We did a tumor normal analysis of bone regions at the diagnosis of ACD, for mass at the diagnosis of MDS and ML, bone, intestine, heart, kidney, and dermal at autopsy. Rough V600E was detected in bone regions at the diagnosis. Although she was treated with interferon alpha, azacidine, and intermediate starving, BRAF P600E was detected in samples of the intestine and heart of C, suggesting ECD was not cured by this treatment. It is noteworthy that BRAF P600E was not detected with a cut of 2% in bone, kidney, and dermatal tumor regions at autopsy. These tumor regions might consist of macrophages without BRAF mutation, so it is likely BRAF V600E mutant cells affect distant regions. It is also notable that mutations of eight genes, such as the possibly pathogenic by polyphen, a tool for prediction of functional effects of synchronucleotide polymorphism in bone models at diagnosis of NDS. The same with these of ML. In these eight genes, three genes are specific with bone marrow samples. In summary, mutational profiles that differ from each region, and the black mutated cells might not always exist in tumor regions of ACD. In conclusion, we detected FA2P786L, MIBPC3D790HN. TRD5, P115, L, SAT4, R102, C, and TC4, F17, L mutation as the candidates of novel driver mutations in ECD. In addition, mutational profiles of multiple organ regions in an ECD case can differ from each other. Further research for new target of treatment and other specific mutations are warranted. This is all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Great. So if anyone has questions for Dr. Ayoma, please go ahead and put them uh, into an email to myself. It's jessica.corcoran at erdheim-chester.org. 
and I'll be more than happy to forward those questions to him to answer and we'll email them back to you. Next, we have another recording. This recording is uh, a doctor in Israel, Dr. Ashrat Roka has uh, recorded her session for us. Okay, so hello everyone. And thank you very much for the opportunity to present our research in this very important meeting. Today, I'm going to talk about the role of non-coding RNAs and their contribution to the inflammatory and neoplastic characteristics of Erdem Chester disease. Up until two decades ago, this was the central dogma of molecular biology. The DNA is transcribed into RNA and the RNA is being translated into protein, which is the functional unit of the cell. However, the revolution of the Human Genome Project at the early 2000s identified that only 2% of our genome is being translated into proteins, and the other 98% were was termed junk DNA. Today, we know that the 98% of the genome has a very important role in gene regulation. These non-coding molecules that do not encode for protein include different types of RNAs, such as tRNAs, microRNAs, long non-coding RNAs, SNOW, LINK, and circular RNA. All of them have a pivotal role in controlling cell division and cell death. Uh, also, these molecules have a role in drug resistance and immune escape. They affect cell migration and invasion. They affect angiogenesis. And what that was known as junk DNA in the past actually plays an important regulatory role in our cells. And the largest group, the largest group of these uh, non-coding molecules are the microRNAs. So microRNAs can be used as biomarkers because first they are limited in number to date. 2,600 uh, microRNA molecules have been identified in the, in the human genome, compared to 20,000 protein coding genes. And second, they are highly stable in clinical samples, and we can purify them from almost every biological fluid, such as blood, saliva, urine, and even from formerly fixed embedded tissues. In addition, they are phylogenetically conserved between different organisms, and they are differentially expressed between healthy individuals and uh, different types of neoplasm. Also, microRNAs uh, have, have a role in, in gene regulation. This small molecule of microRNA here in red can bind to mRNA with a sequence-specific manner, such that a double-stranded RNA is formed within the cell. This double-stranded form is not stable and results in RNA degradation and therefore, the mRNA is not being translated into protein. And lastly, microRNAs can be used as a therapeutic target. This is an example of a mouse model uh, with aggressive lymphoma, which has overexpression of specific microRNA. And if we treat this uh, mouse with a specific microRNA inhibitor, we can see that the tumor size dramatically decreased over time. So today, the pathogenesis of ECD was mainly investigated at the DNA level, where it was found that ECD patients harbor mutations mainly in the ERK and PI3 signaling cascades. However, the knowledge about non-coding RNA in ECD is lacking. And since our lab is focusing on non-coding RNAs in hematological malignancies, our research goal were, goals were uh, first to identify uh, whether ECD patients have a unique microRNA expression signature, and second, to characterize uh, ECD-specific microRNA expression before and following treatment with biological drugs, and third, to study the role of microRNAs in, um, in disease pathogenesis. And before I will uh, talk about the results, I would like to thank our patients for contributing their samples for this research and to our collaborators in the US, France, and Israel for collecting patient samples and for their involvement in this study. And to Ron Weissman, a former PhD student in the lab who conducted the experiments I will show you today. So in order to examine whether ECD patients have a unique microRNA expression profile, we use the nanostring and counter platform. This assay provides the expression pattern of 
800 human microRNA molecules in one sample. So first we screened uh, plasma samples of 16 ECD patients compared to 11 healthy controls. And as you can see here, uh, based on their microRNA profile, healthy plasma samples here in blue uh, were clustered separately from the ECD samples here in red, indicating that ECD patients have a unique microRNA expression signature. And this is a heat map showing the top 50 microRNAs uh, that, that were uh, the most statistically significant altered between ECD patients and healthy controls. And each column here represents a different uh, patient or control sample, and each row represents a different microRNA molecules. And blue indicates for high expression, and green indicates for low expression. And what we can clearly see is that most of the microRNAs were downregulated in ECD in the ECD group, suggesting that uh, suggesting loss of regulation, uh, and as a result, potentially involvement in disease development. So next, we uploaded uh, those 50 microRNAs to a bioinformatic tool uh, that predict in predicts uh, uh, in which biological pathways those microRNAs participate uh, based on their mRNA targets. And here we can see the major molecular uh, pathways involved in uh, ECD and the specific microRNAs uh, that regulate key genes within this pathway. And this means that if the microRNAs are downregulated in ECD patients, their target genes are upregulated, and the pathway is activated, leading to cell proliferation and survival. And I will focus my talk today on the LET7 family microRNAs and on MIR15A that were among the most significant downregulated microRNAs in ECD patients. So the LET family uh, microRNA is considered as tumor suppressors uh, since they regulate on oncogenic pathways, including the ras ref mec erg cascade with a negative feedback loop mechanism by which overexpression of the MAP kinase pathway inhibit the expression of the LET7 uh, family microRNAs. And as you all know, ECD patients exhibit high level of the MAP kinase pathway and indeed, we found that the LET7 family members are downregulated in ECD patients as compared to healthy controls. So next, we ask ourselves, what will happen to this family when we will uh, inhibit the air cascade using MEC or BRAF inhibitors? And to answer this question, we, this question, we analyze the expression of uh, the LET7 family members in nine ECD patients who were effectively treated uh, with MEC or BRAF inhibitors. And this is an example of three patients uh, from the cohort. And we can see that after 16 weeks of treatment with MEC inhibitor, the LET7 family members showed upregulation. And this upregulation uh, was in parallel to their clinical response assessment by PET-CT. And this is an example of one patient who did not respond to the treatment. And we can see that there is no difference. The colors are the same. There is no difference uh, in the microRNA levels before and after treatment with MAC inhibitor uh, as observed in the other patients. So this suggests that in the future, we may use a simple blood test to measure response to treatment instead of radiological examination that requires high level of expertise and is much less comfort to the patient. So another interesting microRNA is MIR15A, which was found to be downregulated in ECD patients. And we identified a potential binding site for MIR15A in the 3' UTR of the 6CL10 gene. And 6CL10 is interesting since it was previously found to be highly expressed in inflammatory and autoimmune diseases and in cancer. So binding uh, of 6CL10 to its receptor activates the MAP kinase and the PI3 kinase uh, cascades, among others, and results in cell proliferation, migration, and chemotaxis. So we hypothesize that if the microRNA levels in, uh, are low in ECD patients, 
uh, it cannot inhibit six CL10, leading to six CL10 overexpression. And indeed, when we analyze six CL10 levels in plasma samples of ECD patients, we found higher level of six CL10 uh, as compared to healthy control. So. Uh, the binding site of MIR-15A uh, to the 3 prime UTR of 6CL10 uh, was proven by Lucifera's assay. And uh, this was the expression of MIR-15A and 6CL10 in peripheral blood of ECD uh, patients. And we further evaluated the expression of MIR-15A and 6CL10 in tissue biopsies of ECD patients. Um, from ECD lesions as compared to match healthy tissues from post-mortem autopsy. And we found that MIR-15A is down-regulated in tissue biopsies from ECD patients and that 6CL10 is overexpressed, like we just saw in the peripheral blood. Also, 6CL10 was upregulated uh, in the protein level as we can see um, by immunohistochemistry as compared to non-ECD control patient. So next we wanted to test if restoration of MIR-15A will reduce the 6CL10 levels. So we used the human myeloid cell line, KG1A and Oki AML3, which overexpressed the MAP kinase pathway uh, due to RAS mutations. And we also used the BAF3 cell line uh, that stably expressed a vector with a BRAF V600E mutation. So all these cell lines have overexpression of the uh, MAP kinase pathway, like we see in ECD patients. And transfection of these cells uh, with microRNA 15A mimic upregulated its, ex its expression in all three cell lines and KG1A are presented in green and OK AML3 in red and BAF3 in blue. And uh, this restoration of MIR-15A, this overexpression of this microRNA, reduced the 6CL10 level, uh, uh, mRNA levels, and uh, also decreased the 6CL10 secreted protein level. Okay, since high level of 6CL10 uh, were previously shown to activate the MAP kinase pathway, we examined whether a down regulation of this chem chemokine following MIR-15A overexpression affects the ERK cascade. And as expected, the expression of phosphoERK was down regulated in all three cell lines, overexpression, overexpressing MIR-15A. So next, in order to determine whether the, this downregulation of uh, phosphoERK is biologically relevant, we analyze the expression of three representative ERK target genes, uh, DUSP6, uh, SPRAY2, and LIN28A. 28, and we found that uh, their expression levels were uh, greatly reduced in all three cell lines that overexpressed the MIR-15A uh, mimic. So this indicates a true biological effect of phosphoERK uh, downregulation. So having established that phosphoERK cascade uh, is inhibited, we analyzed the expression of the LED7 family microRNA and we hypothesized that since microRNA 15A uh, expression leads to downregulation of 6CL10, uh, which leads to downregulation of phosphoERK target genes, particularly LIN28A, we should observe the upregulation of the LED7 uh, family, sorry, family microRNA. And indeed, we found that the LED7 family uh, microRNAs were upregulated in all three cell lines after transfection with MIR-15A mimic. We also showed that overexpression of MIR-15A uh, resulted in substantial potential uh, increase in the rate of apoptosis in all three cell lines uh, after staining with an XNPI. And this was associated with downregulation of the anti-apoptotic genes BCL2 and BCLXL, uh, which counteract apoptosis at the mRNA level and uh, at the protein level. 
Also, overexpression of MIR 15A decreased cell proliferation, as shown here by WST assay and cell cycle analysis, and oncogene transcription factors such as MIC, BCL6, cyclin D2, and PI3K were also downregulated following MIR 15A overexpression. Lastly, we examine whether treatment of ECD patients with MAC inhibitor has an effect on the levels of MIR-15A and 6CL10. So we analyzed plasma samples from seven patients before and after 16 weeks of treatment with MEK inhibitor, and we observed that MIR-15A was upregulated after treatment, and this was associated with a downregulation of 6CL10, suggesting a potential feedback loop between MIR-15A, 6CL10, and the ERK cascade. So overall, we suggest that uh, MIR-15A has a role as tumor suppressor that acts by downregulating 6CL10 and LIN28 uh, expression through inhibition of the MAP kinase uh, pathway. And to conclude, we show that circulating microRNAs may assist in the future for establishment of biomarkers for diagnosis and treatment response. Uh, that microRNA highlights additional layer of post transcriptional regulation in ECD pathogenesis, that MIR-15A acts as tumor suppressor in ECD and its expression is downregulated in ECD patients, and therefore upregulation of this microRNA in ECD patients may have a potential therapeutic utility in the management of this disease. And by this, I want to thank my team uh, Professor Ofer Spielberg and Dr. Roy Mazor, who runs the clinical service, uh, Ran, uh, Ran Weissman, uh, our PhD, their graduate uh, PhD students, to the other lab members and to our uh, research supports, and specifically to the Histiocytosis Association, who supported this research. And thank you for listening. Great. I apologize for the blurry slides, everyone. We will have these available following the meeting. I apologize they weren't available for the before the meeting. If you have questions, Dr. Roca is online. If you would like to pop into the Q&A to leave your question there, I'll wait a few minutes to, to allow you to do that. Hi, good to see you. Hi, it's good to see you. It's a very nice, uh, it was, it's very nice to hear everyone and see everyone great talks. Thank you for inviting us to present today. I agree. It's been a great meeting so far. Well, you can email us. Um, we, if you can't get in touch with Dr. Rocco directly, you can email us and we will definitely connect you with her to get those answered. So we appreciate you jumping on. Glad Thank you. you can make it towards the end at least <laughs> <laughs> to see your presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Good to see you. So Next we have, it's not gonna start for another uh, 15 minutes. So to stay on time, we're gonna play a break one more time. Hopefully we can get caught up uh, after that. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Thank you for staying with us during the break. We're gonna begin uh, the next session for case studies. Dr. Jerome Razanam Mahari is uh, back with uh, his dramatic eff efficacy of Vimurafenib. Yeah, uh, I want to talk about the last patients uh, that we have with a diagnosis of uh, ECD uh, in our department. And uh, I will tell you the, the result of the dramatic efficacy of Vemurafenib on uh, psychiatric uh, symptom revealing BRAVC1E of 600E, sorry, ECD. So uh, the background, then uh, we'll talk about uh, the case presentation, uh, discussion, and uh, conclusion. So um, as we all know, ECD is a rare clonal histocytosis characterized by uh, some clinical and radiological feature uh, showing, uh, in most cases, uh, long bone uh, osteosclerosis. Uh, there is a bilateral uh, perinephric fat infiltration, uh, vascular sheeting of vessels, and a tissue biopsy uh, showing uh, fibrosis and uh, infiltration by uh, CD60 uh, 
68 plus CD1A neg uh, histocytes. Uh, there is frequent MAP kinase gene mutation in patients with uh, ECD. And um, in the biggest series, there is um, a lot of patients with uh, BRAF mutation. Uh, if you look at the neurological involvement of uh, ECD, um, if you look at uh, the difference we publish uh, from uh, PTS Alpetri Hospital and from uh, DMSK, um, about 20% uh, to 40% of patients uh, may suffer from uh, neurologic features of ECD. Uh, there is three forms. The, you can have pseudotumoral lesion, you can have vascular lesion and uh, you can have pseudo-degenerative lesion, but uh, this one seems uh, less frequent than uh, what is described in uh, LCH. Uh, regarding the clinical features, um, science uh, seems to be heterogeneous, but uh, there is a frequent cerebral, uh, cerebral sorry, disability patient can suffer uh, with uh, dysarthria, uh, seizures, and uh, diabetes. Uh, what uh, is uh, shown uh, on the MRI is that there is a T2 uh, lesion. Uh, it can occur in uh, brain parenchyma, mostly cerebellum, but also in uh, spine or brain. You can have uh, meningal structure involvement with uh, dura or uh, hypothalamic axis. You can have uh, some vascular sheathing responsible for uh, seizure. And uh, frequently, you have uh, osseous involvement with uh, maxillary sinus um, involvement. And uh, in a rare case, uh, but uh, mostly uh, in uh, neurogenerative degenerative case, you can have a cerebellar atrophy. So uh, the sign um, of uh, neuro uh, ECD are heterogeneous, mostly depending on the form and uh, the location on, of the lesion. And uh, as far uh, as I check on the literature, psychiatric signs are not described uh, in the spectrum of uh, neuro ECD. So uh, I will present you uh, this case. Uh, it's a 91-year-old woman uh, who was addressed uh, in uh, Dijon University Hospital for um, acute dyspnea and cognitive impairment. Uh, she has uh, no treatment uh, except uh, benzodiazepine and a medical history of grave disease, uh, central uh, retina vein occlusion, macular degeneration, and one episode of this venous deep venous thrombosis uh, eight years uh, earlier. So um, regarding the, um, the acute dyspnea, it was caused by, by pericardial infusion, and uh, it was uh, treated with uh, colchicine um, very, very quickly. But uh, regarding to the neurological feature, it began uh, eight months ago. She uh, was hospitalized in the Lyon hospital. Uh, she had a delirium with auditive and visual hallucination. Uh, at that time, uh, when you look at the, um, uh, the contrendu, she had a static and dynamic cerebellar syndrome. She had a complete uh, blood sample analysis uh, with a normal test, uh, the cerebral CT and the electroencephalogram were normal. And um, the physician said that uh, the patient suffered from elderly cognitive decline. And uh, she was treated with olanzepine uh, for the delirium, but uh, it didn't seem to be uh, really effective. So uh, when she was... Uh, in the, the hospital, uh, when you look at the neurological um, examination, there was a cerebellar disability with a SARA score evaluated at 14. She had a mild cognitive impairment with MMSE at uh, 22. She had a visual hallucination and a persecutory delusion. And uh, she had uh, no other abnormalities, especially no extra pyramidal syndrome. So uh, because of the cerebellar syndrome, she had uh, an era, uh, uh, MRI uh, showing uh, T2 intense lesion in the pons. 
uh, we have performed uh, a lumbar puncture, uh, which was uh, normal with a normal locality count. Protein level were normal. Uh, culture uh, for bacteria and uh, virus were negative using polymerase chain reaction. Uh, the search for oligoclonal band was negative. Uh, she also had uh, the search in CSF and blood of uh, autoantibodies associated with uh, paraneoplastic syndrome, and the search were negative. Because there was uh, a cognitive uh, impairment, we have tested uh, the top protein level and uh, the phosphorylated isoform, which were uh, normal. And uh, in the kit on the, of the lumbar puncture, uh, when you, you test uh, the top protein level, they also test the neopterin level, uh, which was uh, above um, the the normal value at uh, 9.4 uh, nanomole per, per liter for um, a cutoff of five. It was the only abnormality that you have uh, on uh, this patient lumbar puncture. And uh, because there was initially um, um, uh, a cardiac involvement with pericardiac infusion, uh, we perform uh, a body CT really looking for uh, a tumor. And uh, what we saw is that there was um, vascular sheeting of aorta. Uh, so uh, first of all, we say that it might be uh, related to GCA, but uh, the CRP level were no more. And uh, when you look at the, um, the kidney, uh, there was uh, perinephritic, fa perinephritic fat uh, infiltrations. Uh, so uh, at that point, we say that uh, patient had coated aorta and airy kidney. So, so it's uh, really looking like an ECD. So um, we perform a PET CT uh, showing uh, radio tracer uptake uh, in the pons, uh, the same lesion that uh, is seen on the MRI first. And uh, there is a bilateral uh, osteosclerosis of the long bones, really uh, suggestive of ECD. So then um, to assess the diagnosis, uh, we ask a radiologist to perform um, hairy kidney biopsy, uh, showing some tissue infiltrations by histocyte. Uh, on the left, uh, you see the infiltrations. Um, in the middle, uh, you uh, can see uh, that they are CD68 uh, positive. And uh, on the right, uh, you see that they, they were uh, CD1A uh, negative. So um, we say that the patients have uh, ECD because there is a uh, long bone osteosclerosis, airy kidney, coated aorta. Uh, we perform uh, an MRI uh, showing uh, right atrium pseudo tumor, and uh, there was a um, BRAF uh, mutation by parosequencing on um, the kidney tissues. But uh, the question remaining uh, is that, uh, is there a link between uh, the delirium and uh, the ECD? And at that time, we'll, we really don't know if uh, it could be related to ECD or uh, maybe related to uh, elderly decline. But uh, we treated the patients with uh, idos interferon. So uh, she's got um, two uh, two weeks of uh, interferon treatment, uh, waiting for the BRAF status. And when we received the BRAF status, we um, treated the patients with uh, vemurafenib. And what we saw uh, is that there was a regression of the psychiatric symptoms seven days after uh, the initiation of uh, interferon therapy. And um, there was no delirium 10 days after target therapy treatment. So then uh, we saw the, um, the patient once again, uh, eight weeks uh, after uh, she was discharged from the hospital and she had no more delirium. There was a mild improvement of the cerebellar disability with a SARS score at 12 versus 14 at the beginning. There was a cognitive improvement with uh, MMSE at 26 versus 22 at the beginning. 
and uh, I will show you then uh, the imaging, but uh, there is an improvement. So um, on the upper, uh, upper slide, uh, you see it at the beginning and at the lower after eight weeks of treatments. So if you look at the, um, the pons lesions, uh, there, there is a decrease of uh, the radio tracer uptake. If you look at the MRI, uh, it's not exactly the same uh, sequences because uh, the patients uh, really move at the first MRI, but the radiologist said that this is better. And uh, if you look at the lung bones, there is a, a decrease uh, of the radio tracer uptake. So uh, a clinical improvement and a radiological improvement after target therapy treatment. So uh, what uh, we present is uh, a neuro ECD form with psychiatric uh, symptom as first onset. Um, maybe this is really important to look at cerebral disability in cognitive decline because uh, it can be uh, related to uh, a condition, not only ECD, but other condition. And uh, we show favorable outcome with target therapy. Uh, so, uh, regarding neuro ECD, the diagnosis is based on the clinical presentation, uh, the imaging, the exclusion of uh, differential diagnosis, and uh, the normal CSF analysis. Uh, regarding to the treatment, uh, I dose uh, interferon, and now uh, we need to treat patients with target therapy. But the biggest problem is that uh, there is an incomplete uh, diffusion in uh, CNS, and we don't know if uh, there is a correlation between uh, the disability and the imaging. And just uh, I want to talk about uh, the only abnormality that there was on the CSF on the patients. What I say is that there was elevated neopterin. So uh, this is a biomarker of cerebra cerebral uh, inflammation. Uh, if you look at the literature, it's caused by viral infection and macrophage activation in microglia. So uh, we think, but uh, it has to be confirmed that it could be a marker of neuroastocytosis in the setting of sterile culture. So to conclude, uh, we present um, del delirium as the first manifestation of uh, neuro, neuro ECD. Uh, the importance of uh, the examinations for cerebellar disability, uh, the improvement uh, of uh, the delirium with target therapy, and maybe there is a role uh, for monitoring neopterin uh, in the diagnosis of neuroACD. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Our panelist, Dr. Diamond, would like to come on and ask you a question about this, yeah. this study, this case. Oh hi, sorry. I guess um, um, it's very um, it's very interesting. I, you know, I've had had many patients. I don't know if you've had the same experience who yeah. didn't have psychiatric problem. Maybe had a a, a pre morbid psychiatric sort of tendency to depression, anxiety, which which worsened sort of subsequent in their diagnosis, and may or may not have been very well managed by targeted therapies. I don't know if you've had a similar um, experience. Uh, no, that she had uh, she had no no psychiatric disorder, uh, but uh, the only thing um, that I saw is that uh, she had uh, the thrombosis of the uh, it was uh, of uh, venous in the eyes, and maybe I think that it could be the first manifestation of uh, of ECD if you look at the ophthalmologic. Uh, feature of ECD because there was no nothing that uh, that explained that that thing but so maybe I think it could be in this presentation the first manifestation but there was no depression or a thing like this in these patients okay I'll just this is for another report but in the in the registry depression and anxiety are inordinate very 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 common yeah Probably, you know a third or more um, have self-reported depression and anxiety but that's very interesting thanks okay. I think we could probably move on to uh, Dr. Abdo. Dr. Andre Abdo is located in Brazil. Thank you, Dr. Resident Ma Thanks. Mary, <laughs> for joining us. Uh, we're happy to have you on for the second session. It's a pleasure to see 
everybody again. It's been a long while. I'm going to start share my my screen. Uh, let me know if you see me well and hear me. Okay. Everything is up. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would like to thank uh, the Global Alliance for the, this honor invitation. I'm I'm very honored with that, and also. Um, I'm here to present a clinical case. It's not not, uh, not something revolutionary, but it's something that reward us in our daily life as a doctor dealing with uncertainty, rare diseases, pain, and every every other difficult. So uh, it's just a case, but it's a uh, I would like to to uh, get back this the the humanity by being a physician. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Philip Otavio, they're my uh, partners here in our lymphoma center. Uh, and also uh, Jean-Francois Emile, Professor Emile from France that helped me and helped me a, a lot of times, including Julia. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this, this clinical case. It's, it's, I divided it in two parts and then some points of discussion and conclusion. Uh, this is a, a case presentation of uh, 52 uh, uh, very gently uh, year old female. She was born in, uh, in, uh, in Barretos, it's a very small town here in Sao Paulo state. She was married Catholic. Um, she has no comorbidities. Uh, on February, 2018, she started to note some little spots on the skin with fast evolution. Uh, pruritus associated in worsening uh, these lesions after exposure to hot water. Uh, no other symptoms at this point, and only after one year searching for uh, a diagnosis after visiting to almost 10 dermatologists, a biopsy was performed and the diagnosis was uh, urticaria pigmentosa. It's a, it's a type of uh, cutaneous mastocytosis and nothing so interesting so far. So this is uh, the, the first presentation with the skin lesions, there are the biopsies, uh, and uh, this here is the, the, the pre-taste. Uh, the diagnosis was urticaria pigmentosa, and okay. The next four months after the diagnosis, the patient uh, got worse uh, with uh, and developed with fatigue, fever, bone pain, weight loss, and diarrhea almost uh, uh, five times a day. Uh, she was referred to a hematologist and after a full investigation, uh, uh, our, our colleague just find out uh, that the patient has also disseminated lytic bone lesions, uh, uh, GI involvement with diarrhea and hypoalbuminuria, uh, and also bone marrow with, with cytopenias. And of course, after that, uh, the diagnosis of uh, aggre uh, aggressive systemic mastocytosis was, was easy, uh, was, was, was done at this point. So here is the bone marrow with uh, the kit, uh, immunohistochemistry, immuno uh, and also for triptase, and uh, an, an, NG net, an NGS was performed with uh, kit mutation, the D. 816V, this, this is the most common, and also tattoo mutations. And now we have the diagnosis of uh, uh, aggressive systemic uh, mastocytosis. So bone marrow plus kit mutation, a uh, high level of triptase, uh, uh, GI involvement with diarrhea, and also leg bone lesions, so we have aggressive stem mastocytosis. And midostarin was started in February 2020 on the, on, the, on the average dose. But three months after starting on midostarin, the patients start to present new skin lesions, including uh, seborrheic dermatitis on the scalp, uh, nail dystrophy with onychodicosis, and deafness with uh, ear discharge. No one, no one of these symptoms were related to midostarin or uh, toxicity with, uh, uh, due to midostarin. And at this point, her triptase level was a little bit lower. It was six nanograms per, per microliter, but it was also 
uh, higher than the, the normal range. So here is the new uh, lesions from, uh, from her skin and also the, uh, the seborrheic dermatitis, the skin, the, the, the ear dis discharge, and she was uh, almost deaf in, uh, in a very short uh, time. And here is the, the, the oncolicolysis, the nail dystrophy. So <laughs> any idea what could be, what could be uh, happening now? She has a diagnosis of aggressive, aggressive systemic mastocytosis, very clear, and also started with new symptoms three months after starting midostarine. Otorrhea and deafness, scalp dermatitis, uh, nail dystrophy, uh, Okay, new, new ideas were, out, were welcome at that point. And that, this time, uh, that time the patient was referred to me because she has this, uh, this mastocytosis uh, diagnosed, but also some features that could, in some points, someone just, uh, just, just uh, think about that it could be histocytosis, histocytosis or, or something like that. In August uh, uh, 2019, but because of the symptoms of the deafness, uh, video otoscopy was performed and a mass, a soft mass on both ears were identified and was, uh, was performed a, a surgical biopsy here and of also a curatage that the patient could uh, uh, recover the, the, the ear function. So, uh, after that, so we got a diagnosis in this analysis of this soft mass. It was CD1A positive, uh, very positive. You can hear that on the uh, on the greatest uh, view. And also, it, it has a little bit of mast cells, but it wasn't so important as were in the in the initial diagnosis that I've showed you on the bone marrow and uh, the the skin biopsy. We perform it at this sample uh, a PCR for uh, for BRAF 1600 E or K mutation and it was wild type it was negative so we uh, it is a uh, probably a multi systemic lung cell histocytosis uh, with uh, B BRAF wild type so uh, I was a little bit confused on that on that case particularly so I asked for help for uh, Professor Emile, Jean-François Emile in France. I sent him, uh, I sent him uh, the, the samples for review and performing uh, in GS, uh, in the ear, in the, the, the soft tissue from ear. Uh, at this point, the patient was extremely symptomatic without absolutely no response to midostarin uh, for up seven months of use. So uh, I have to do something. Uh, and so far, we had an, a diagnosis of aggressive systemic mastocytosis and a multi-system lung hair cell histocytosis, uh, BRAF wild type. So in November 2020, after discussion with the patient, the patient and the family, I tried to start cladribine because mast mastocytosis uh, was uh, in the past treated with cladribine, and we have some some very few data, but uh, that, that uh, LCH could also respond to cladribine. And it what I done that time. So I went to look to, to, uh, to the medical literature to find something and I find just one single one paper uh, regarding systemic mastocytosis and associated malignant bone marrow histocytosis. And in this paper, it isn't clear which kind of histocytosis they are talking about. So, but but it was the only thing that I found when I look up into the medical uh, literature. So uh, I was kind of <laughs> lost here. And uh, Professor Emilio just sent me back his, his, his review and the diagnosis of LCH was confirmed with CD, with Langerine really strong positive here. You can see that, but he also find performing NGS and B, another BRAF mutation, not uh, V600 uh, ERK, 
but this one here was a, a long name and with the VF, uh, VF of 38% high VF. So uh, we had the diagnosis of Langer Hassel, a multi system Langer Hassel, hysocytosis, beer half. Uh, with BRF C uh, 1457, 1471 deletion. So it was okay. Once again, I'll get to literature to try to find anything else. But at this time, after six cycles of cladribin, that was, uh, was uh, this is the patient after that. The, the skin lesions uh, was were uh, better. They are hyperchromic here. And so probably they are healing. The tryptase level just went down to the normal range. She has an improvement in the, uh, in the skin lesion, the, in the urticaria pigmentosa, no more diarrhea. Uh, and uh, by that point, I thought that the, the, the component of aggressive systemic mastocytosis was just uh, somehow controlled. But something wasn't so good. And this is a PET-CT exactly after the six cycles of, of chemo of cladribin. And of course, I had a, another bone marrow biopsy. You can, you can see here the, the, the FTG uptake uh, on the pelvis, on the bones. And uh, again, uh, LCH was identified with CD1A, really strong positive. Uh, uh, S100 and uh, very few mast cells. So uh, with a, 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 a proliferic index, uh, a little bit high. So um, that point I thought, okay, I'll, I treated the mast component, but what's happened with LCH that doesn't respond at all to cladribin? Then I got the information from uh, Jean-Francois Jean Emile. So we have this, both diseases, but uh, mastocytosis was in, in complete remission. And I have a refractory mood system LCH. And I went again to search and I found that exactly the same mutation was described in two cases and with resistance to remorafenib, but with really good response to MAC inhibitors. Uh, here in Brazil, we have a lot of difficult on acquiring MAC inhibitors, uh, even BRAF inhibitors. It's not easy. Uh, and I think this is the first patient that we use MAC inhibitors uh, on uh, uh, histocytic disorders. In June 2021, we started trametinib one milligram daily, just one month after there was no more fatigue there was no more dermatitis. She recovered uh, all uh, hearing, no more bone pain. She went to gym again. Uh, she kept no sign of uh, clinical or uh, lab mastocytosis. The triptase levels uh, are, are still uh, uh, in a normal range. And uh, after uh, this month, she, she developed a grade two acne form eruption, but was uh, very manageable with uh, topical steroids. This is the PET-CT after three months on trametinib is the dramatic response. And of course, this is a, a little lymph node here, but it was due to uh, 15 days after uh, the patient took the, the Pfizer vaccination. So uh, I had a control and, 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 and just disappear after that. So the patient is in now, CR uh, of, L, uh, of a refractory LCH with trametinib. This was my last appointment with her and I was very impressive, very happy. She also, uh, so she painted her nails. This is not, uh, this, is nail, this is not nail uh, 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 dystrophy, this is, this is painting her nails. So it uh, was a very uh, interesting uh, result. Some points that I'd like to discuss. I think there there are more doubts than uh, actually some uh, some uh, answers. But this is the first case that in our knowledge that is uh, asynchronic uh, aggressive systemic mastocytosis and mood centric uh, mood system longer than cell histocytosis in the same patient. Uh, we have two different uh, mutations profile. The mastocytosis is, uh, is clearly what we would expect in the, in the aggressive systemic mastocytosis, a kit mutation and also an attached mutation. But 
on the, the LCH, we have this, uh, this non V600E V6, e or K mutation on BRAF. So uh, probably, I don't know, you can think that they are come from the uh, common myeloid progenitor or they come from the same place. We, we actually don't know. We are now looking into the old samples of her mast, mastocytosis and trying to figure out if we find uh, this BRAF mutation. Um, and another possi possibility is that this uh, LCH uh, was a case of, uh, of another uh, 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 hematological neoplasm uh, with non-mass uh, non lineage. So uh, uh, indeed uh, with association with system mastocytosis. But we haven't seen in literature any case like that. So that's one where I would like to, to uh, show for you uh, this data and, and, and also this case because it was a very, uh, very good result. My conclusions, uh, for instance, if you allow me, is the rare presentations on rare diseases. We need to share everything that we have because there, when we share, we just multiply our knowledge. Probably based evidence medicine or clinical trials, we would be replacing that cases for precision medicine because in, the, in, in my reality, this is a little bit uh, tough to do at this time, but we are getting better. And genomic and molecular information was a turning point in this case, of course. Um, partnership is indisputably important for low-income countries uh, or big countries as Brazil. So I thank you very much for the French team to, to help me, of course, Professor uh, Emil, uh, Julian Harosho. So, and that is it. on behalf of my friends and my colleagues and our Lymphoma and Myeloma Center at our institution here in Sao Paulo in German hospital, Oswaldo Cruz. Uh, I would like to thank very much the Global Alliance, especially Jesse and Kathy and the patient, the patient that was a very gently patient and her family for all uh, their patient and everything that we try and have a very open discussion in every step that we take. So nothing, nothing so revolutionary, but a clinical case on our daily practice. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here today. Hope to meet you again. Uh, in person because uh, it's it's been a it's been a long winter. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop my my sharing. Thank you, Andre. That was that was very good news story. Thank you for sharing it with us. We have one question in chat. Actually, two. Uh, Dr. Goyle would like to know if you have a nylon guitar in your background. <laughs> It was a question by Gurov. Yes. <laughs> Can you find the Q&A in the bottom? Yes, I, I'm, I'm trying to see the great work we did behind the answers for you. Classes of individual procedures in medicine with patient rare disease. Thank you, Gurov. It, 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 it is what was I uh, actually concluded. Uh, thank you. Gurov uh, just gave us a lecture uh, a month ago. Uh, was a brilliant lecture of LCH also. But yes, I think in this case, particularly the, the medicine, uh, the, 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 the precision medicine, the precision care was the turning point in this case, in this case because uh, I was some kind of lost and the, the, the medical literature didn't help me a lot at this point. Thank you, Guru. <laughs> so we have another question in the Q&A. So that's a separate, uh, in a different box. And I, I cannot pronounce everything. So if you want to go there and read that for us from uh, Dr. Bonometti. I can see that, Jitsi. Okay, let me send it to you. Okay, it's in the chat. <laughs> uh, Abdul, cytopenia in the bone marrow was only associated to system mastocytosis involvement. Was there any evidence of LCH cells or myeloid neoplasm or JAK2 mutation analysis or a myeloid panel performance? Uh, very, very good question. Thank you very much for the question. The first, uh, 
the first signs of cytopenia were, were uh, when the patient has the diagnosis of aggressive systemic mastocytosis. There is no evidence of LCH at that point. And in, she has a, a clear uh, mutational profile of, uh, with uh, kit mutation and uh, all the bone marrow that I've shown uh, was uh, involved by mast abnormal cells with uh, immunohistochemistry positive for uh, uh, kit for for kit and tryptase. Uh, we did we did Jack two mutations that was negative at that point, but after that after the the the, the mast was in remission we we found that the bone marrow was was then replaced by LCH. So it's a strange case, but thank you very much for, for your question. Oh, <laughs> I, I saw now Guru. Yes, there's a nylon guitar in the background, yes. <laughs> no, I, I'm not that talent. Thank you, my friend. Uh, I, I'm actually moving now. I'm going to another house now and there's a lot of chaos here, but thank you. So no chance in the show, I guess. <laughs> thank you so much it's always a pleasure andre that was a thank very interesting very much, case Nancy. and I'm, I'm glad it ended happily thank so you very much. we are uh, i think we ended a little bit uh actually we, in, we ended up right on time for andre's session and you'll notice that we did have a break scheduled for right now but we also uh, uh accidentally scheduled the next talk for the same time so we're going to go ahead and go forward since we've already had a few breaks and uh, Dr. Roser will be coming on to uh, begin our organ involvement sessions. Um, is it all okay for you? Yes, you everything, everything's all set. Thank you. Okay. So um, it's a pleasure to be here to present um, that work um, that um, I perform with the PTSL Patriot team, especially um, Julien Arroche. Um, uh, on the role of vascular endothelial growth factor uh, in ECD. So you, you all know ECD, uh, that rare is just cytosis um, with a tissue infiltration of uh, CD68 positive CD1A negative histiocyte deriving from the mononuclear phagocyte system and uh, harboring recurrent mutation in the MAP kinase signaling pathway. Um, that estiocytes uh, are surrounded by inflammatory cells, mainly lymphocytes uh, and fibrosis. And um, vascular endothelial growth factor A, uh, so called BEGF, uh, is the main regulator of angiogenesis. In adults, it's um, particularly implicated in cancer and inflammatory processes. Um, Besides its uh, angiogenic role, the EGF um, was also shown to be uh, implicated in the recruitment of monocytes um, in uh, mycobacterial associated granulomas. Um, it could also be responsible for some diseases manifestation, um, such as the so-called POEM syndrome, uh, in which uh, severe GF serum levels are particularly high and it's, think, it's thought to be to increase vascular permeability and, and to um, be responsible for cardiac involvement of the disease. Uh, the mutation of uh, RAS oncogene um, has been shown to upregulate VEGF expression. So for that reason, we thought that uh, VEGF could be implicated in uh, histiocytic diseases uh, pathophysiology. It has been studied in uh, LCH, um, in which uh, histiocytes from uh, LCH lesion have been shown to express uh, VEGF. And in a small French series of uh, 24, 24 ECD patients, um, serum VEGF levels were high when compared with um, healthy controls. So uh, we performed that study um, with two aims to first to determine if BEGF was expressed by ECD histiocytes and to assess levels of serum VEGF in ECD patients and to determine if they were associated with some patient's characteristics. 
So it was a retrospective study, including patients with ECD seen in the French uh, Referral Center for Histiocytosis at the PTSL Petria Hospital in Paris from 2009 to 2019 that had at least one serum VGF determination. Um, the histological samples of patients with extremely high or low uh, serum VGF were centrally reviewed and uh, studied by immunohistochemistry for uh, VGF expression. So we included 248 patients um, in which 53.2% uh, um, had high serum VGF, uh, that means upper than 500 picogram per milliliter. Um, and um, patients with high serum VGF levels had a median VGF of uh, 840 picogram per milliliter um, compared with uh, 280 uh, for patients with low serum VGF. So um, in the biopsy of ECD patient, uh, we studied 26 uh, histological samples and we found a, a VEGF expression, um, intracytoplasmic expression of, uh, in histiocytes um, that was moderate to high in all patients. Uh, you can see here two examples on the left side an ECD exantelasma with the infiltration of uh, um, histiocyte in the skin, here a two tone giant cells, and below uh, the staining with the two anti VEGF antibodies. Um, showing um, intracytoplasmic um, VEGF expression by histiocytes. And on the right side, a perirenal infiltrate of ECD um, with the histiocytes surrounded by fibrosis. Um, on the upper right um, um, slide, you can see the CD68 staining showing histiocytes and below the, the VEGF expression that is um, high in uh, histiocytes. As control, we studied four uh, patients that had a reactional sinusal histiocytosis. Um, and it's in these uh, four cases, we uh, found no VGF staining uh, on uh, histiocytes. So then um, we studied patient and compared patients with high and uh, low serum VGF levels, um, sex, age, and BRAF status were not significantly different uh, between uh, that two groups, but um, cardiac and vascular involvement were more frequent in patients with high serum VGF level, as you can see on this table. Um, especially uh, uh, the right atrium pseudotumor, uh, coronary artery involvement, and the uh, uh, carotid aorta um, were more frequent in patients with high serum VGF levels. Also, um, the retroperitoneal involvement was um, more frequent in patients with high serum VGF. Regarding um, treatments, patients with high serum VGF levels are, had more frequently received a targeted therapy that could reflect um, the, the higher frequency of uh, cardiac involvement in that group of patients. So um, we observed a, a VGF expression by ECD site. We um, had shown that a uh, um, VEGF serum levels can be high in approximately 50% uh, of ECD patients. Um, we wanted to know uh, uh, if that the serum VEGF levels could decrease under therapy and could help um, monitor that patient. Um, so we had consecutive measurement of uh, serum VEGF in 183 um, patients. Um, with a median time between the two determination of uh, 24 months. And we observed a significant decrease of uh, serum VGF. And could that uh, serum VGF variation could occur uh, early? Um, to answer that question, we 
um, we um, studied uh, 139 patients that had a second uh, VHGF serum level determination six months after the first one. And we also observed a, a significant decrease of uh, serum VHGF levels uh, under therapy. Um, so then, be, because uh, cardiac and vascular involvement were more frequent in patients with high serum VHGF level, we ask either that um, serum VHGF variation could reflect uh, cardiac and vascular response uh, under therapy. We studied uh, 45 patients that had a consecutive cardiac MRI um, with a median time between the two exams of 48 months. 69% of patients had um, a thoracic aorta coating, and that um, persisted in all patients under follow-up. But cardiac involvement um, could um, regress under therapy, um, and we observed uh, six complete responses of that uh, cardiac involvement. 20, 25 patients had a partial response, 12 were stable, and two patients underwent a uh, progression of the cardiac involvement under therapy. When we uh, looked at the serum VHF level variation under therapy, we uh, observed that patients that underwent uh, progression had um, uh, significantly higher variation of serum VHF levels when compared with patients um, in which uh, cardiac involvement regressed either completely or partially. So um, for the first time, we demonstrated that VEGF is uh, expressed by ECD sites, that serum VHF um, levels can be ele elevated in approximately 50% of ECD patients. That um, elevation of serum VHGF is associated with the presence of a cardiac and vascular involvement of the disease. And the, the variation of that serum VHGF uh, was correlated with uh, the response of cardiac uh, involvement of ECD under therapy. So we think that um, that study could help understand the pathogenesis of ECD, and perhaps it could help uh, the detection and the follow-up of uh, the cardiac involvement of the disease, um, especially when uh, cardiac MRI is not uh, available uh, systematically. So I'm finished. I, I would like to thank uh, the teams of the Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital um, especially the, the internal medicine department and Julien Arroche, um, Florco and Obar and Zaire Hamoua. Um, also, um, the, the cardiovascular imaging department uh, with Marine Bravetti that um, read all the, the cardiac MRI and the pathology department, um, Lida Dong and Frédéric Charlotte. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Roser. Do we have any questions? Uh, Dr. Rodell is asking, is there anything known about the potential use of VGF directed therapies in ECD? Um, uh, to my knowledge, uh, it has never been uh, tried in ECD, um, but um, th there is some description in the literature of um, LCH patient uh, children that had um, an eye involvement of uh, LCH and that received intraocular injection of anti VOGF therapy. Uh, that's the only thing I, I know about uh, anti VOGF uh, in histiocytic diseases. If we have no other questions, we can take a, uh, a, mi a few minutes and we can begin again at 12.05. Thank you, Dr. Roser. It was great to have you on today. Thank you.
Great, welcome back. We have next, uh, we're still uh, in ARGAN involvement, Dr. Francesco Pegarero. Hi everybody, can, can you hear me? So uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm gonna discuss with you the results of uh, this study uh, that we performed on kidney involvement in ECD together with the, the French group and the Israeli group on 195 patients with, with ECD. So uh, we know that retroperitoneal infiltration is found in around 60 to 70% of ECD patients, and it is usually asymptomatic. Uh, data on perirenal involvement mainly, uh, is mainly limited to the pre-targeted era. Uh, for example, in, in this study from Yelfimov et al., which was published in 2014, uh, chronic kidney failure was reported to occur in up to 38% of patients and mainly secondary to obstructive uropathy or vascular peduncle involvement. However, it, it is not clear the, the optimal man management of obstructive uropathy and also the efficacy of medical treatment on kidney involvement in ECD. And also what, what's not really clear is that the true prevalence and severity also of CKD in, in, and kidney failure in ECD. Uh, and there, we, there are no, uh, no predictors of kidney outcome in the disease. So we uh, aimed at describing the phenotypes and the severity of kidney involvement in ECD uh, but also at investigating the, the impact of ureteral procedures and medical treatment at kidney level and to identify uh, predictors of kidney outcome in, in ECD. Uh, we retrospectively assessed uh, 199 patients followed between 2000 and 2021 at four referral centers in France, uh, in Italy, in Israel. All of them had histology confirmed ECD and abdominal imaging available at diagnosis. Uh, their clinical data were collected, uh, which included, of course, uh, EGFR as kidney function evaluation, were collected at baseline at one, two, and five year uh, follow up, when, of course, when available, and at last follow up. Uh, this is the typical macroscopic appearance of perirenal infiltration in ECD, uh, where we see this uh, thick infiltration of the renal capsule and of the perirenal area, which in, in the microscopic image corresponds to a very uh, deep fibrotic infiltrate. Uh, here we see the, the renal, uh, the, the kidney, which is... Uh, uh, which uh, is uh, partially uh, in, touched in the capsule, but uh, here we see the, the normal fat uh, of the perirenal area, which is uh, quite uh, completely uh, substituted by, by this fibrotic infiltrate, where we also can see uh, this isolates of histocytes and small lymphocytes that we better see at higher magnification. Uh, in our court, retroperitoneal involvement was found in 73% 70, of patients. Uh, kidney involvement uh, is typically described as hairy kidney. However, we also found some, some very uh, huge and dramatic uh, expression of the disease at this level, like in this patient with this uh, very, very large mass that uh, occupied the entire abdomen. Uh, also, periureteral involvement was found in around 40% of patients, and in most of them, also hydronephrosis was, was found. Uh, kidney atrophy was found in 16 patients, uh, around 8% of, of our cohort while vascular peduncle involvement was found in 30% of patients and in half of them, 
it was associated to stenosis of the renal artery. Finally, uh, adrenal involvement was found in around 40% of patients, and it was bilateral in most cases. Uh, at baseline, we found significant differences uh, between patients with and without perirenal involvement in terms of uh, sex with a predominance of, ma of male patients with uh, perirenal involvement in terms of age with uh, older patients more prone to have perirenal involvement in terms of comorbidities, uh, namely hypertension and coronary artery disease, but also in terms of organ involvement, uh, large vessel and heart, uh, in terms of the presence of the detection of the B, BRAF B600 mutation, and uh, as, as expected in terms of kidney function. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the median EGFR at diagnosis was significantly lower in patients with perirenal involvement uh, compared to those without perirenal involvement, and it remained uh, lower at Oh, at all the, the time points of during follow-up. However, we did not find a significant difference in, in a faster progression of kidney function loss in the perirenal group. What we say on the other end is that uh, patients with perirenal involvement at two and five years had around 40 to 50% of CKD35. Uh, we analyzed a uh, response to treatment at one year from introduction of, of first-line treatment. Mm, we found that uh, patients receiving targeted treatments, uh, which were BRAF inhibitors and mTOR inhibitors uh, in most cases, had more frequently uh, a radiologic and a metabolic uh, response at kidney level compared to patients receiving uh, conventional treatments, so interferon alpha and, and cytokine drugs. But sur quite surprisingly, we also found that patients receiving BRAF uh, had more frequently an EGFR worsening at one year compared to patients receiving other treatments, and also that ureteral procedures, which we uh, kind of, some kind of expected to, to deeply improve the, the function of patients, uh, in fact, they, they had, in most cases, the patient remained, uh, maintained a stable EGFR or had a worsening on, of EGFR at one year, while only four patients had an EGFR improvement of more than 25%. Uh, overall, nine patients in our court progressed to kidney failure and five were started on hemodialysis and 35% of patients died, 35 patients uh, died, uh, including six out of nine patients with kidney failure. However, we did not find a significant difference in mortality or kidney failure between patients with and without perirenal infiltration. Uh, the panel shows that the time from diagnosis to kidney failure or death or last follow-up and we can see a trend, uh, in, but there is no significance, uh, statistical significance. This was an exceptional uh, case from our series. Uh, it is a patient who received a combined heart and kidney transplant and uh, went well for a while, but mm, at some point he had a recurrence of, of ECD at, on, on the grafted kidney and his, condition, his clinical condition rapidly progressed. And this, this was uh, very uh, particular and surprising finding. Uh, first, because uh, it told us that it's not really, maybe it's not really the perirenal area that drives uh, istiocytic migration and differentiation and proliferation, uh, profile growth mechanism, but uh, the, the, kid, the, the organ itself that might drive this, this kind of migration and disease uh, proliferation. And also, uh, it's, we want, I, I would like to highlight that uh, this uh, 
we we don't want this to discourage from from performing transplantation in patients with ECD. Also because uh, because this is uh, an isolated case, and also because this patient wasn't receiving uh, treatment for ECD. Uh, but of course, we we have to be to be aware that. Uh, if we transplant a patient with ECD, there is the possibility of disease recurrence. Uh, we analyzed the predictors of kidney outcome uh, with two different outcomes uh, that were uh, the risk of CKD for five or EGFR decrease of more than 25% and the risk of, of kidney failure or death at last follow up. At unadjusted analysis, only three. Um, uh, predictors were found to be associated with both outcomes. Uh, and these were a, an age at onset of more than 50 years, hypertension, and a low EGFR baseline. Uh, at multivariable analysis, um, the presence of at least one cardiovascular comorbidities, and namely diabetes, hypertension, or uh, coronary artery disease, were associated to an increased risk of CKD45 or EGFR decrease of more than 25% with an odds ratio of 3.5, while an age of more than 50 years was uh, associated with an increased risk of kidney failure or death with an hazard ratio of 3.3. Uh, quite interestingly, we also found that uh, interferon alpha and other non-targeted treatments were associated to a lower risk of uh, death or kidney failure in our court. So to conclude, uh, we found uh, a frequency of retroperitoneal involvement slightly higher than previously reported. Uh, we also found that patients uh, with perirenal involvement uh, had more, much more frequently uh, already uh, established uh, kidney damage at diagnosis, but did not progress uh, to a kidney uh, function loss more fast than, uh, faster than, than patients without perirenal involvement. Uh, kidney disease seems to be already established at diagnosis, and this might also explain why patients receiving ureteral decompressive procedures did not show a significant improvement in terms of kidney function. Uh, with respect to, to treatments, um, uh, we found that um, targeted treatments, and so DRAF inhibitors and uh, mTOR inhibitors, did reduce size and metabolism of, of the perirenal uh, disease without improving kidney function. However, I have to say that this, this loss of improvement of kidney function might at least partially be biased by the lack of long-term data, because uh, we we also we only collected um, uh, we could only collect uh, kidney function at one year from from treatment for first line treatment, uh, and also uh, by the, the putative effect of the RAF inhibitors uh, tubular toxicity, as for example is reported in patients with melanoma receiving uh, vemurafenib. Uh, we also found that conventional therapies uh, are associated with a reduced uh, risk of kidney failure or death, but also we, we might say that this could be biased by maybe a tendency of using this kind of drugs in patients with a uh, less severe phenotype, or at least this, this was our explanation, what the, the explanation that seems to us more logical to such a finding. Finally, uh, the predictor that we found for, for kidney function worsening and kidney failure or death were the presence of cardiovascular comorbidities and uh, of older age, respectively. So to leave just a few take-home messages, uh, I'd, I'd say that uh, what we can do is to diagnose and treat uh, ECD as early as possible because perirenal infiltration is uh, already established uh, and associated to uh, a poor kidney um, function at diagnosis, and it's very, very difficult to revert. 
what we can do also is to manage as as uh, as as well as we can the comorbidities and other risk factors uh, that we we know very well in the general population are associated to uh, to chronic kidney disease and to kidney failure because this this uh, these factors that we now have a role in the general population seems to have an even higher role in patients with other uh, reasons for for a kidney function loss, such as uh, patients with ECD and perirenal involvement. So I'd like to thank you, of course, all the Florence group, uh, and but also the group from Professor Arroche in Paris, and also Dr. Ray Mazar in Israel, uh, who contributed to our study, and of course. Kathy and Jessica from the Global Alliance for their constant and very precious work. Thank you very much, Dr. Pegarero. That was uh, very nice to hear from you. It's good to see you. We will open up for questions and I'll give you a few minutes to be able to put your questions in the box. Hi, Dr. Vio. Good to see you. Hi, how are you? Doing well. Thank you. So I, I, would, I would like just to make a comment on, on Francesca's work uh, that it was somehow uh, unexpected to have such a, a chronic uh, kidney disease that does not uh, improve uh, whatever treatment you do, whatever interventional procedure and so on. Uh, so this really... Uh, I think the interpretation that Francesco gave is correct. Uh, that means uh, that the disease is a really slowly progressive one and uh, renal damage occurs over time and becomes really chronic damage that does not resolve. So the, the, the two-step interpretation of the data is, is I think, uh, quite uh, um, intuitive and, and logical. Uh, so first of all, you establish the chronic kidney damage over time. You try to treat the disease, you obtain some regression of the perirenal tissue, but this is not enough. And what really contributes to long-term kidney prognosis is the presence of comorbidities, which are normally uh, risk factors for CKD in the, in the general population. So I think this study is interesting, not only because of the, of the kidney outlook, but also because it tells us something about the kinetics of the disease. How many cases of perirenal bulky disease have you seen? Excuse me, I, I didn't get, how many cases of? Bulky, bulky disease, very bulky disease. I think uh, I think we only recall a couple of patients in, in our Italian series. I don't know in the French one. Yeah. Can you guys see the questions? So because the standout as opposed to the regular hairy kidney presentation. Okay. <clears throat> that that's true, Roy. You're right. Uh, that was an extreme uh, picture of a perirenal disease. It was uh, you can actually call them perirenal masses. Uh, or pseudotumoral masses. Uh, that was probably an extreme one. We should rethink of putting a more appropriate image. Gusto. Right. Yes. Uh, just a minute. Well, wait. Wait for a minute here. It would be better. It would be better this way. So, so first of all, really beautiful presentation. Um, so I, I was wondering about these bulky disease cases. We have we have had one one case of, of really extremely bulky perirenal disease to date. And I, I was wondering if you guys found any specific characteristics that, that uh, uh, occur in these particular patients as opposed to the patients with the regular hairy kidney. Because I, I was so accustomed to seeing the hairy kidney that when I've seen this, this uh, PET CT of this new patient, it was, it was, it was really mind boggling. It was, you know, uh, the patient shown in the picture was a very peculiar one. It was a patient that I followed up when I was in Parma many years ago, and uh, he was a BRAF mutated one. Uh, but the, the peculiarity was that he, he only had a, um, a retroperitoneal disease. 
So the bone uh, picture was not typical. And uh, the guy also has a, had a, um, a paraparesis because he had an accident. So I, I don't know if this in some way contributed to the enlargement of the masses or whatever. But uh, certainly um, this was a um, quite unique disease because no bone disease was present and the masses were, were huge. Uh, but but the histology was typical and the BRAF mutation was there, so we think the diagnosis was, was that one. No, no, ab absolutely, absolutely, I agree. We yeah, but that, I, I, I mean, no, 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 no additional uh, peculiarity of the case. I I cannot recall any other aspect of the case that were really actually actually one 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 more question if i may so i guess this this particular patient or patients like him were treated with a with a biraf inhibitor and in, uh, terms, in terms of it, response have you seen have you seen any regression of no the we we are we actually saw this guy uh probably 10 years after the first diagnosis of retroperitoneal masses uh, his condition was very poor. We started uh, vemurafenib treatment, but he died uh, a few months later. So we, we really didn't have we didn't didn't have the chance to uh, assess response to to treatment. It was too much. I mean, his clinical condition was too deteriorated to to have a response. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Great talk, Francesco. Thank you for coming on, Roe. We have one more question in the chat uh, or in the q and Did you find variation of mutations at different involved sites? So, so uh, just to, to be sure, I, um, I, I understand uh, if, if, we, we, if we did perform different biopsies at different sites or if the, there was a uh, the mutation was significantly associated to a uh, to specific localization disease localization. Let's see, Dr. Kuzu, Kuzu, did you want to leave it? Uh, did you want to come on or leave a chat and me message in the chat? Because yeah, yes, we, we at, at baseline we, we found that BRF mutation was associated to to perinal disease, but this uh, we, we didn't find an other association for example with a kidney uh, for, with a worse kidney outcome so it, it was associated to, to to kidney function loss but an unadjusted uh, at unadjusted analysis but it didn't confirm it multivariable analysis so we of course <laughs> My, it might be, I, I can try to, to may show I, you. May I speak? Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we okay. can hear you. Thank you very much for your great presentation and your study. I just wanted to ask whether if you have accidentally find any variation uh, of, uh, for, for any case, any variation of the mutation profile, mutation status of the patients, um, if you have uh, examined more than uh, one site. Because there, I mean, we do see patients and we, uh, we look at for the mutations, but sometimes it is difficult to, to show the mutation, although we uh, prefer uh, NGS studies. Uh, I just wanted to, because there are, there are some presentations that uh, present, uh, that show that there could be some variations uh, of mutations in different sites and different organs. Did you have any, uh, any data like this? Well, from, from my experience, which of course is much more limited than most of you, uh, what what we sometimes find is um, some tissues that have a lower um, sensibility for for mutation detection uh, but um, to my experience i 
never found uh, patients with different mutation at different sites. Uh, what we typically find, find is patients without a mutation, we reperform histology on different sites, for example, the, the skin uh, or the perirenal tissue that are very, very informative in terms of quality of the tissue. And we do find a mutation, but uh, for, what I, for what I know, it never, it never happened, but my, maybe Augusto is more no i i i totally agree with you and i and i think the diagnostic yield of a of a biopsy largely depends on the extent of histiocyte infiltration in the tissue so that this is why uh xantelasma are very good for uh, mutation detection uh, the perirenal mm, tissue is good so it is E easily accessible and uh, uh, has a good diagnostic yield, uh, whereas um, the, the the bone biopsy has many drawbacks. Uh, first of all, the lower extent of histocytic infiltration in most cases, and the second, which is the processing of the bone uh, by a pathologist, which requires decalcification, and this uh, accounts for many false negative results. So basically, you should look at the sites uh, where the histocytic infiltration is uh, has a great uh, um, prevalence and uh, go for that for the biopsy. But we, in our experience, we 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 did not find discordant biopsies. So discordant mutations into different sites. Maybe it can happen when patients have a, a have an overlap histiocytosis. This can be reasonable, but I, to my knowledge, there is no uh, solid evidence that you can have diff discordant mutations. Thank you. Thank you for asking the question. Thank you, Dr. Paguero and Vio for, for coming on and answering the questions and presenting your uh, presentation. We will now have Dr. Ashley Aero from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share our work um, today. And so thank you for, for providing um, that, this chance for us to do so. Um, we are going to be discussing a treatment of non longer hand cell histiocytosis with the MEK inhibitor trametinib. I have no pertinent financial disclosures. And so, of course, just to provide some uh, brief background, um, on the basis of discovery of um, common activating mutations and fusions in the MAP kinase and PI3 kinase pathways, um, Erdheim Chester disease, which was, of course, initially thought to be a predominantly inflammatory process, was subsequently um, found to be a neoplastic process. Uh, I have no doubt that this audience is very familiar with uh, MAP kinase, but just to uh, briefly recapitulate this pathway, uh, it's responsible for translating extracellular growth signals or mitogens into actual cell growth. And so we can see a mitogen binds to a membrane receptor, which allows a uh, RAS GTPase to activate RAF, for example, BRAF and subsequently ERK, which results in the activation of transcription fracture factors and alteration of gene expression. Also, RAS of note does have downstream effects in the second major pathway implicated in Erdheim Chester disease, the PI3 kinase pathway, um, which involves PI3 kinase, AKT, and mTOR. Um, the BRAF V600 mutation is, of course, a, one of the most important to discuss in ECD, and it represents a gain of function mutation allowing for constitutive MAC kinase um, uh, activation independent of RAS signal. And it has been found in uh, around uh, over 50% of ECD samples. Um, and uh, also work by Eli Diamond and collaborators published in Cancer Discovery in 2016 using um, whole exome sequencing and RNA sequencing also revealed um, a number of patients with um, both LCH and non-LCH, including ECD, with um, MAP2 kinase alterations as well. Um, MAP kinase alterations are also um, implicated in Rosai Dorfman disease. Uh, uh, cited a couple of papers here, which um, found uh, RAS mutations and MAP2 kinase mutations um, in uh, RDD patients as well. 
And so on the basis of uh, these molecular changes, there's been great interest in targeted therapy. And of course, the uh, BRAF inhibitor bimurafenib was the first FDA approved for ECB on the basis of the VE basket study. And given its success, there was interest in identifying other genomic alterations implicated in, in non-LCH without this uh, specific mutation. Um, case reports suggested that NAC1-2 inhibitors were potentially efficacious in this population. And so Dr. Eli Diamond and collaborators conducted a groundbreaking study published in Nature, which was assessing the NAC1-2 inhibitor cobimetinib in a phase two trial. And on the basis of this work, the FDA granted a breakthrough therapy designation to cobimetinib in patients um, with uh, histiocytic uh, neoplasms, including ECD, Langerhan cell and Rosai Dorfman without the BRAF um, B600D mutation. And to briefly recapitulate the highlights of the study, it was a phase two trial that enrolled 18 patients with histiocytic neoplasms. And those with BRAF B600D mutations were eligible only if they demonstrated prior in, um, intolerance or resistance to BRAF inhibition. Um, they received cobimetinib, and the primary endpoint was overall response by PET as assessed by a radiologist. Um, and the overall response rate, as you can see, was 89% in the study. And the secondary endpoints uh, were duration of response and progression-free survival as well uh, by PET, as well as um, overall survival by resist. Um, and so um, patients uh, did not develop resistance to treatment, and these responses appeared to be durable, with 100% of patients um, still showing responses at one-year follow-up. And the PFS rate was 94%. Neither um, the median duration uh, response or the median progression-free survival had been reached after a median of 11 months of follow-up. And this included a, pa a variety of uh, patients with a variety of genotypes, as you can see um, in the right-hand side um, on the swimmer's plot. Um, and just to highlight some um, figures from this uh, manuscript, um, the first is a waterfall plot um, looking at about maximum change in tumor metabolism according to SUV measured by PET. Um, the colors of the bars indicate the genetic alterations present. Um, and then there's the swimmer plot, as I mentioned, um, and then a survival curve of pet-defined progression-free survival. In our work, um, we were looking specifically um, at uh, trametinib, and this was a retrospective study. Um, the, the rationale for looking at trametinib um, was to potentially provide evidence to support um, another targeted therapy treatment option. Um, and uh, trametinib is uh, of particular interest given its selectivity and potency. It seems to have a um, longer half-life, um, affording daily dosing, um, and uh, it, again, may represent another option um, for patients. So we looked um, at four centers, at MD Anderson, UCSD, the Mayo Clinic, and Sloan Kettering, and we performed a retrospective analysis clinical data, including age, gender, and ethnicity, as well as symptom uh, burden at baseline and at follow-up intervals, as well as um, sites of histiocytosis involvement. Um, the trametinib was administered daily and titrated to patient tolerance. Um, the doses that were administered in our re retrospective review ranged from 0.5 milligrams up to the FDA-approved dose of two milligrams daily. Response um, was based on the treating physician assessment of PET and CT data with um, complete response indicating complete resolution of lesions and FTG uptake, partial response uh, indicating partial resolutions of lesions and FTG uptake. Stable disease um, was uh, in patients without new, new lesions, although it wasn't defined over what period of time um, stability needed to be um, uh, seen for. Um, and progressive disease um, indicated progressive or new lesions. Um, the resist and uh, PET response criteria that had been previously studied um, by Dr. Diamond and Dr. Gary Ulaner um, were considered as a general framework for response assessment, um, though um, ultimately it was um, sort of the treating physician impression of the response. Um, and adverse events and symptoms were assessed clinically. We also looked at molecular testing from tumor tissue as well as plasma and urine cell-free DNA, um, and variants of unknown significance were excluded. Um, in this study, we ended up looking at 26 patients with um, non-Langerhans cell histiocytosis, including 17 with ECD, 
um, three with Rosai-Dorfman, five with ECD Rosai-Dorfman overlap, um, and one with ECD LCH overlap. The mean age of diag uh, no, a diagnosis was uh, 49 years old, and most patients were men. Um, the most common genetic alteration seen was the BRAF V600E mutation um, seen in 35% uh, of patients, all of whom had ECD except for one patient with ECD and uh, RDD overlap. Uh, two patients with the BRAF mutation were also discovered to have NF1 mutations on tissue-targeted next-generation sequencing, and two patients had concomitant um, ASXL1 alterations. The two patients um, with the BRAF v 600 mutation also had other BRAF mutations that were detected that coincided, um, and um, six of the 26 patients, or 23%, um, all of whom were wild type for BRF V600E had MAP2 uh, K1 alterations on tissue targeting and GS. Um, most uh, patients were treated with a starting dose of trametinib one milligram by mouth. This was in nine patients. On the most frequent dose, uh, the conclusion of therapy was 0.5 milligrams daily. And for most patients, trametinib was not the first line of therapy. It was used in combination with other agents um, in three patients, or 12% of our group. Um, one patient was treated with uh, trametinib in conjunction with the brafinib, prednisone, and amikinra. One was treated in conjunction with brafinib, and one was in conjunction um, with memorafinib. The overall uh, response rate was 71%, and the best response um, as determined by treating clinicians in 17 patients who had a valuable disease was um, revealed partial responses in 10 patients or 59% and complete response in two patients or 12% was the remaining five having a stable disease. Um, at the median uh, follow-up of 23 months, time to treatment failure um, was analyzed and defined as the interval between initiation of therapy and discontinuation for any reason, including side effects without progression. And the median time to treatment failure um, was uh, 37 months with a 90%, 95% confidence interval of 19.3 to 54.7 months. The median overall survival was not reached. Two patients um, did pass away during the course of uh, their treatment um, on a retrospective review. One was of um, complications of uh, known ECD involvement and one of unrelated causes. Um, and of these patients, one of the patients uh, died while on therapy and the other five months after treatment discontinuation. The median progression-free survival was also not reached. Um, and at one year, 94% um, of patients were alive without disease progression. Um, and um, uh, this is a swimmer's plot showing um, the time on therapy for our patients segregated by um, best response um, and by um, BRAF genotype. Um, again, most patients um, started at a dose of one milligram daily and most ended at a lower dose. And uh, some of these dose reductions were due to toxicity. So to comment briefly on that, um, 17 patients in our group or 65% were documented as having a significant treatment related toxicity. Um, most of these patients had rash, um, which was commonly described as an acneform rash involving the face. Um, other um, reported toxicities include mucositis, dizziness, diarrhea, chills, rigors, and drug-induced hepatitis, as well as cardiac toxicity. Um, seven patients were taken off therapy due to these side effects, which included a patient with cardiac toxicity, a patient with uveitis, uh, one with drug-induced hepatitis, two with renal toxicity and one due to rash. Another patient was documented to have discontinued therapy due to toxicity, but the toxicity itself um, specifically was not documented. Um, uh, four of six patients with a duration of treatment less than or equal to four months discontinued to toxicity. Um, one patient uh, passed away and one was lost to follow up after moving out of the country. So, we, um, you know, following the hypothesis that MAP kinase uh, pathway um, activation is a hallmark of non langerhans cell disease cytosis, such as ECD and RBD, um, we looked at patients who had been offered um, uh, the MEK inhibitor trametinib, uh, irrespective of underlying um, molecular profile, and we did this in a retrospective fashion, um, showing that overall two-thirds of patients um, responded, which is 
um, commensurate with what had been um, pub published previously um, with the uh, cobimetinib work done by Dr. Diamond. The treatment effects in um, this group also appear to be durable. Um, and this um, sort of previously validates findings that MEK inhibitors um, may produce durable responses with an acceptable side effect profile, um, even um, when used at lower doses um, or in patients that require uh, dose reduction due to toxicity. Um, this may represent a viable treatment option in patients without um, the BRAF E600 e mutation or in patients who have an unknown uh, molecular profile. Um, there are, of course, several limitations to our study, including the fact that it involved a small number of patients overall, and this was sort of a real-world retrospective study in which patients were on other therapies, um, and sometimes the um, data regarding um, toxicity or response assessment was not as granular as we may have liked it to be. Um, uh, but um, it uh, does appear that um, trametinib um, may be potentially um, a treatment option that merits further investigation in patients with uh, non-LCH as it could um, potentially produce uh, durable disease control. I'd like to thank um, our uh, collaborators, um, which include um, my mentor, Dr. Philip Yonku, um, Dr. Kersrock, uh, Dr. Diamond, as well as Dr. Goyal, who I know is on the call today, Dr. Goodman, Dr. Patel, um, Dr. Ron, Dr. Lanner, um, as well as our research collaborators, Z. Lee and Derek Dustin, MD Anderson, and Jason Young, as well. Um, so thank you very much um, again for the opportunity to speak today. And that concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ashley. We have a few questions. We have uh, one in the Q&A, and we have Dr. Hirosh that would like to come on and ask you uh, live. So I'll go ahead and add him first. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, just uh, the, the five uh, uh, patients uh, that were ECD plus uh, RDD, whether MAP2K1 mutated, and whether men or it were it was uh, because I didn't see that on your slide. And and the other thing, did, did you did you perform a, a, a dosing of uh, trametinib in the blood, uh, or was it like retrospective and not? Uh, uh, um, I didn't see that on the slide, so that was it was just by curiosity. Thank you, Dr. Hirosh. Yes, um, so th this was retrospective, and the patients with ECD overlap um, did have um, um, alternative um, alterations in MAP kinase pathway. Um, these were um, four patients had MAP2K1 alterations and one with MRAS, I believe. Okay. Dr. Hirosh, did you have any follow up questions? Uh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thanks very much. It's very clear. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, Dr. Goyle will actually come on as well. You just give him access real fast. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hey. Hi. Um, great work, Ashley. Thank you for putting this together. I think one of the questions that comes up often is, you know, when we look at studies of cobimetinib or trimetinib, we still have the major chunk that's BRAF V600 E mutated. Um, so the question comes up is what is the rate, uh, response rate in the ones who are not BRAF V600 E mutated? And are there any patterns or anything that you could pick to see like, you know, who are sort of super responders? Because I noticed that, you know, most of them are partial responses and not CRs. I mean, of course it's a retrospective study. so the you know the response assessments are variable right any any thoughts or any signals you pick that uh, with your evaluation so i think we need um, a little bit more data to draw sort of uh, firm conclusions but i thought it was interesting that in our um, in our group of patients only one um, fully available patient without any MAC pathway alterations um, was included, it, but that patient did achieve a partial response. Um, so I, I think at this point, I'm not certain if any definitive patterns can be uh, teased out. Gaurav, I, I, would, I would agree, both from this data set, which I'm familiar with, with Ashley, and from mine, I don't, I don't think we have yet a sense of pattern with respect to you know, disease or genotype. 
Thank you all. If there are any more questions, you can place them in the Q&A. We'll give it a minute. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you for coming on, uh, Dr. Arrow. Was, uh, we were happy to have a treatment talk to add to uh, the, the agenda. So we thank you for coming on at such last minute. <laughs> thank you for having me and a thank you to all my mentors and collaborators. It's been great learning about this disease and, um, and, and about the research opportunities um, that are involved in it as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, our last session is Dr. Diamond covering uh, outcomes for discontinuing targeted therapy. Uh, hello again. So those are the same disclosures as before. So the, the background to this, um, as we all know, is that very remarkable responses to targeted therapies have been observed with uh, ECD and other histiocytoses. Um, optimal, optimal duration of treatment still remains unknown. We do know from um, Julian's um, love study that for BRAF V600D mutated ECD, there's very frequent relapse if um, uh, a targeted therapy is interrupted. However, um, the outcomes with other targeted therapies, um, sort of other mutations, other disorders uh, is not known. Um, so my, the uh, objective of this retrospective study, or I should say partially retrospective and partially prospective, was to characterize the frequency of relapse in ECD and other histiocytoses for patients for patients treated with targeted therapies. Um, I say that it's mixed retrospective and prospective because some of these patients were part of the COBE trial in which um, interruption of therapy um, was uh, planned and prospectively followed. And some, um, this is a retrospective analysis. And so, and I was also looking to see whether there are disease or treatment factors related to um, subsequent relapse or relapse-free survival. Um, so the patients um, that were studied were those with ECD, LCH, rosite Dorfman, um, xanthogranuloma, or mixed disease. Um, and uh, these are were patients who interrupted tar targeted therapy entirely, um, followed by either observation alone or um, efforts for maintenance or quote unquote consolidative chemotherapy. There are some patients who I, I gave chemo uh, after their targeted therapy to see what happens. Um, and they were followed for either clinical or radiologic response. Um, so we collected whether the patients were on BRAF inhibition, MEK inhibition, or dual therapy, um, their duration of treatment, their best response at the time of interruption. And then uh, they were followed for uh, their relapse-free survival. Um, we did a landmark 12-month um, relapse-free analysis. Um, and then we looked at who uh, was rechallenged. Uh, and what their best response was with rechallenge and duration of response after rechallenge. Clicking problems here. Um, so uh, these are the these are the patients. There was twenty. Um, eight had ECD, and then uh, the others had mixed ECD, LCH, or Rosite Dorfman. A couple had Langerhans RDD and um, xanthogranuloma. Um, most had bone disease and or um, neurologic disease. And you can see the other distributions of organs. Um, the tumor mutations, so 12 out of the 20 had BRAF V600E, and then sort of other um, BRAF indels, KRAS mutations, um, MAP2K1, one um, MAP2K2 patient, the RAF1 patient, and one patient had um, was of unknown mutational status um, and varying prior lines of systemic therapy. Um, they were mostly either on BRAF inhibitor monotherapy or MEK inhibitor monotherapy with uh, two patients who were receiving dual BRAF MEK. Um, 13 of the 20 had achieved a CR um, with their treatment prior to interruption. Um, median duration of treatment was about a year prior to interruption um, with you know, 12 out of the 20 treated for more than a year and um, eight uh, treated for less. Um, half were deliberately stopped to pursue observation, four were for toxicity, two lost access for one reason or another, and four, um, I transitioned to chemotherapy. That chemotherapy was methotrexate in two patients, cladribine in one and cytarabine in one. Um, so um, 14 of the 20 patients uh, relapsed. Uh, almost all were in the same site, uh, and then almost all were subsequently rechallenged. Um, upon rechallenge, um, nine of the 14 um, uh, had a complete response or partial response. 
one had stable disease, and then for various reasons, three patients um, were not um, valuable um, for, for recaptured response. And the duration of response um, was um, zero to you know, 84, 84 months. Um, this here uh, is a swimmer's plot of the entire cohort. Um, so the, the, the time in the middle, the time zero, is the time of treatment interruption. Um, and the patients without relapse are the top six, and the patients without uh, with relapse are the bottom. Uh, and the bars are color coded by um, uh, histiocytosis subtype. Um, and so you can see to the left the duration of treatment prior to interruption um, and the duration um, uh, of either observation or treatment following the interruption. And so what you can see is the six patients who did not relapse. Um, you know, uh, you can see visually that they were treated for longer um, prior to treatment interruption, and five of the six uh, had achieved a complete response. I can tell you that that, that fifth patient, the BRAF patient, was like a, a decimal point from a complete response, so it was, was, was pretty close, even though technically it was partial. Um, and uh, the patients who, were, who did not relapse were uh, treated uh, all with a MEK inhibitor, although one patient with um, dual therapy, and they were, um, with one exception, non-BRAF mutations, so you know, MAP2K1, KRAS, uh, RAF1, and MAP2K2, whereas the patients with um, relapse were predominantly BRAF V600E um, or no mutation identified, and um, relapse occurred um, you know, at a varying um, duration after treatment interruption. Um, and you can also see on this plot that, um, you know, Rechallenge uh, led to um, a recaptured response, you know, in, in most instances, which is what I talked about before. Um, so this is um, this is a Cox proportional hazard analysis, just looking at all um, relapse relapse free survival. Um, and what you can see is that the BRAF V six hundred E mutation um, was associated with um, uh, shorter relapse free survival. Um, and treatment with a MEK inhibitor was close to significantly associated with longer relapse-free survival. And then um, this, um, this is the landmark analysis, which is looking at 12-month relapse-free survival. This is, um, there are caveats to this in the sense that um, patients who uh, relapsed after 12 months um, are not sort of included as relapses, and patients who weren't followed for 12 months are not included. So this this is a limited um, sample and is problematic uh, in that way. Um, but in this analysis, patients with um, ECD versus non-ECD histologies uh, were more likely to not relapse within 12 months. Um, so uh, uh, in summary, um, as, as has been sort of observed casually, and I think also um, observed within Julian's study, you know, we uh, relapse following interruption of targeted treatment is common, but um, I think this does raise the question of um, whether there are certain selected patients who may um, enjoy greater relapse-free survival, and that would be either patients who are BRAF wild type, um, non-ECD histiocytosis, treated with MEK inhibition, um, and perhaps a longer duration of treatment prior to interruption, um, more data is needed, uh, and if anyone would like to contribute to this um, data set, I would be, I would very gladly accept um, more cases. Um, and thank you to my, um, to my colleagues, and that's it. Great, thank you, Eli. I'm just gonna leave the, the Q and A up for a few minutes if we can uh, put any questions there. Hi, Eli, can you hear me? Can. Yeah, I you know looking at that um, that swimmers plot, you know you also can say that there are patients who may not relapse. Correct, if that's my understanding. Yeah, I mean six of the twenty did yeah. not have, so have we not really, relapsed. So Go, going on, you know, we, two three years. Yeah, so we don't know who will not relapse. I guess that's really the question now. Um, to select, and you didn't find any signals in that data set. No, but I, th I think the dogma that all patients relapse may not be true. You know? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that was my takeaway when I looked at that slide. Um, um, I see. Sorry, I see. I see Matt's question. Um, so, um, 
first of all, I'll say to Matt, all the patients treated with chemo relapsed. Um, they, those were really over the last many years. Um, and two of the patients sort of had mild disease. And I had this idea of um, they were ECD and giving them methotrexate as sort of as a quote unquote maintenance, um, thinking that it would be it would somehow be easier on them than the low dose targeted therapy. And that was actually not true. And they relapsed sort of on the methotrexate. Um, and then the other were patients that I probably would have given chemotherapy to in the first instance, um, but their, their clinical situation was very severe. And I started with targeted therapy to get them in better shape. And then I sort of tried sort of chemotherapy later on and uh, both patients relapsed while on the chemotherapy. So that flirtation ended shortly, I'll put it that way. I mean, it didn't work for those four, I'll put it that way. Okay, great. So next up, we are actually uh, going to have a panel of our experts join us so that we can open the floor to general questions or, or questions pertaining to the slide, uh, to the presentations. Hi, it's Mark Heaney. I, I'm just gonna follow up from the last talk and ask Eli a question. Are there, are there patients now that you think are candidates for uh, chemotherapy approaches over uh, targeted therapies for ECD? I mean, for, for ECD, I, I pretty much do targeted therapy only for the most part. I mean, um, the, the, there was only the, the one patient that I gave the cladribine to um, really was interested in doing something in efforts to sort of be off treatment entirely. Um, and I had already stopped her BRAF inhibitor. She had relapsed, so we rechallenged. I mean, there was, you know, so this was, a, this was an effort to, to do something. I mean, and it's a rational thing to do because there's been responses for cladribine. So, but um, I, have, I find less and less of a role for chemotherapy. And, and I'll ask another question and open it up to the rest of the panel. For patients in whom um, molecular genetic analysis is not available or fails, uh, are those patients in whom you would consider empiric uh, BRAF inhibitors, empiric uh, neck inhibition, uh, interferon? How, how would you uh, think about uh, prioritizing the available treatments? You know, in, in the presence of a known ECD diagnosis for the absence of uh, molecular genetic information. Um, I, for a, a mutationally unknown ECD patient, I would go for a MEK inhibitor first. Um, doesn't always work, but it, but it usually does. I would say the instances that I've been, that I've been sort of coming, I'm coming to be least surprised when empiric MEK inhibition does not work is um, uh, Rosai Dorfman disease without an identified mutation. But for, but for ECD, um, I have, I, I, I would go for empiric MEK inhibition. I think that that's appropriate. But I'm curious what others think on the panel. The sort of the initial, um dogma or initial thought when the when your trial was published uh, on Kobe was that you know if you don't have a mutation just choose a MEK inhibitor and we are seeing more and more in practice that that may not be true in all BRAF wild type histio and also in RDD as you had said you have said so do you like in practice one of the questions is do you consider given the limitations with NGS and the cellularity would you suggest sort of considering rebiopsy uh, if the NGS is negative, let's say, because there are a lot of technical issues there. And in our, some anecdotal experiences on rebiopsy, we have seen some other fusions or something that may explain um, alternate pathway than beyond just map K arc, which we thought to be driving every case. I mean, I'm, I'm curious what the others do. I, I mean, I certainly try and re-biopsy to the, to, the, to the extent reasonable. And some of the patients, there's only, biop there's only so many biopsies patients can have, but you know, if, if, if doable and appropriate for a time frame, then we try for sure. Do we think interferon is like dead for treatment in like our 
practice in general? Like I'm, I'm just going to disruptive question in general. I know targeted therapy is cool, but you know, if we look back and the series and even the Chinese series that was published uh, a year or two ago, the response rates were pretty high and the side effects, um, and Mark may have, and some others may have a lot, ex lot more experience with interferon use, pig related version. What do you guys think? I think it's I think it's good. Uh, Antifon is good, but it depends on uh, probably the severity of uh, the involvement. Like something I would I would not do right now anymore would be to treat a patient with uh, meningeal infiltration or um, pericardial effusion with high dose uh, interferon. I would I would probably start I, I, I would definitely start with a targeted therapy which would be either a MEC inhibitor or BRAF inhibitor depending on the uh, uh, molecular status but uh, I think uh, interferon therapy still uh, has a place for a milder form of the disease and and probably uh, you can you can spend like six months to a year to see if the patient is uh, responding and tolerate and and the tolerance uh, of course which is a, a, an issue but it's also an issue with the targeted therapy so I think it, you you can view it as like you can gain some time on the number of years you're going to be on targeted therapy afterwards so that's still how I continue to to uh to 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 see uh, things and and the other thing also which which i see more and more is uh, uh the uh, occurrence of uh, uh either cmml or uh, uh, uh et or other uh, myeloproliferative neoplasm associated where uh i i didn't know that uh, because I, I'm not an hematologist, but uh, uh, PEG interferon is also one of the uh, possible treatment of this uh, associated uh, uh, disease. So, uh, and the, I mean, I, I still find a, 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 a place for, for this uh, treatment. Yeah, I mean, as someone who, I guess, for quite a while only had interferon available. Uh, I have patients who are still taking interferon, responding, tolerating it very well. And so um, I think it's, um, although I think I agree with everyone that the targeted therapies are probably uh, more effective and are probably moving to front line. Um, you know, I, I agree with Julianne's assessment that, that they still represent active therapy and trying to identify who might be best uh, uh, best candidate for one over the other, I think is something we may want to consider going forward, but. Um, I would say we uh, we do the same. I mean, we kind of follow the European uh, protocol, um, but we have several patients in the UK who have been maintained for years on interferon or or methotrexate, mostly, I guess, with skeletal disease. Um, I guess the interesting question will be the ones, I was gonna ask Eli, the ones that stayed in remission, um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that with more numbers, you'll see that these are the low volume, low risk patients. So there may be the ones that actually only need to take inhibitors for a couple of years might be the same group as the ones that are quite easily treated on methotrexate and interferon. And, I mean, it would be nice to have a choice of therapies, but that might be an interesting, uh, an interesting patient choice, I guess. I see we, we have a, a question and if I had a little more skill, I could probably figure out how to, uh, Dr. Benoit, Jessica, are you not on mute? Yes, I, Dr. Van Lar, would you like to, I'm going to go put him on, sorry, I thought he was on there. Yeah, he should be coming on. Yep, talking is permitted now. Thank you. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes. Okay. 
Well, thanks. Uh, wonderful presentations and uh, a good panel. I would like uh, to ask, what would be the place for NTL1 in uh, uh, in this talk, that you're in this discussion? I, well, if, uh, I, I usually uh, uh, give NTL1 to patients uh, uh, who have I usually use it after interferon or if you have contraindication to interferon personally. And I usually use it for mild forms of disease with essentially bone pain and high CRP and, and not much more other sites of involvement or like uh, perioranal infiltration. But I do not um, use it if you have a pericardial infiltration or CNS involvement because. I have had personal experience of um, uh, progressing disease under uh, uh, anakinra. But apart from that, uh, I have uh, several patients who uh, have a controlled disease with uh, this uh, drug. The, the, the only problem is that they have to take a shot every day. And um, some patients do not like it and others, uh, prefer that than having uh, peg interferon once every week. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it has uh, its advantages and, and, and the, my, in my experience, it doesn't work for, for uh, the, the severe involvement. And, um, and obviously for the uh, surveillance of the uh, patients, it's, it's always complicated because you can't really uh, check on the CRP value. But, it, it, I have uh, a lot of patients who are uh, improved with this drug. I don't know what's the other field about it. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Interferon uh, uh, is, is for us it's nowadays difficult to get, and our patients really uh, don't like it that much. I, get, I have given it quite a lot to uh, to other diseases, but it's uh, well, they don't uh, they don't like it. Thank you. So there's another uh, question in the chat from Dr. Kuzu. Uh, I don't know whether he'd like to ask, he or she would like to answer the, ask the question live or I'll read it. Uh, I will give her access and see if she'd like to come on. Hello, thank you very much again uh, for all your great talks. I we have uh, we have few cases, uh, but one uh, two cases was very interesting. They were two siblings, and had Langer Hansel histiocytosis at the same uh, period. And one of these patients was uh, also having MDS MPN overlap pathology. Uh, myeloid neoplasm. We uh, also examined all the family predisposition uh, in with um, sophisticated genetic tests, but we do, couldn't find any um, any relation or any any suspicion of uh, predisposition, myeloid neoplastic predisposition. Uh, in that circumstances. Uh, uh, how could you explain such uh, such a situation uh, in within your in experience uh, with the hypothesis that uh, causes uh, the, the diseases? How do you uh, how could you speculate? Maybe I'll ask Ben to. Uh... To have the first pass at that as our representative pathologist. Yeah, can you hear me? So, yes. um, so basically, I mean, we don't really know at this point, there's still germline uh, sequencing studies going on for possible new familial syndromes and histiocytosis, although they haven't really been uncovered at this point in time outside of some in Rosydorfman disease. Uh, but as far as understanding of, of a, a predispositions to m both myeloid neoplasia, neoplasia as well as histiocytosis, um, we, we don't know, we don't know predisposition syndromes at this point in time, although possibly we'll discover new ones in the future as more germline sequencing is, takes place. 
Um, possibly. Um, so you said both you, these are siblings. Uh, they were they're they're not twins, correct? No, they're not qu twins. No. And and they're were they adults when they presented? Like I'm, I'm assuming with MDS and all that. So. So sorry, I couldn't get the question. Um, I was. What what age are these? What age are these patients basically? Oh, they they, 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 they are young. Uh, no, they are younger. Thirty six, uh, twenty six and twenty nine. They're not older. Okay. Okay, so twenty six, twenty nine. So, um, possibly again, we we know the histiocytoses are myeloid neoplasms. We have seen about overlap about uh, ten to sixteen percent um, of patients with histiocytosis with other co-occurring neoplasia based on some work that came out of the uh, came uh, published in Blood with the French group and the MSK group in, in twenty seventeen. Um, but why there could be cell origins, uh, they could have a similar cell origin, which again, we don't know exactly the cell origin. That's still a, a major question right now for long-run cell histiocytosis as well as others, because uh, they have the same mutation arising um, at, uh, at an earlier stage in hematopoiesis. Um, and that, that, uh, and then it, it expresses, uh, and, then they, so the, and then they had to develop a new expression signature, perhaps at a new, at a new stage of hematopoiesis that leads one to a myeloid neoplasm, uh, a more classic myeloid neoplasm, such as MDS versus um, versus histiocytosis at different times. But again, as far as fetus syndromes, we don't know anything at this point in time that we may discover in the future. And uh, and it's very interesting. It's a very interesting question for cell origin um, studies, which are underway, and we don't uh, potentially know um, what it could be in this situation. However, it's uh, it's a very interesting question, and I'm thinking it's possibly it could be a could be some it could be some predispositions that we're not aware of at this point in time. Um, with histiocytosis and myeloid neoplasia, and again to the 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 lack of germline studies so far in histiocytic neoplasms. Um, so right now, it basically the bottom line we don't really know, but it's very interesting potential cell origins that we can learn uh, from the various mutations um, at various stages of metaphysis that may have another alteration that occurs later and uh, later on that. That, that uh, at the stage of hematopoietic development that leads to, to the development of a myeloid neoplasm versus the development of a histiocytic neoplasm at different times. It sounds like this. It sounds like your case is, your case had patients developing his, histiocytosis first, and then, then they developed myeloid neoplasm that was discovered at a later time point. Correct? Uh, not actually. At the same time, uh, we have discovered so, the the two pathologies. Uh, we have actually, we, we didn't know whether there was any uh, uh, myeloid neoplasm, but when we examined uh, the, the histiocytosis by NGS, we found SF3B1 mutation and as well as the MPL mutation, which are uh, uh, regarded with the uh, uh, myeloid neoplasm uh, with uh, uh, myeloid neoplasm with ring steroblasts and thrombocytosis. So yes, these uh, patients, uh, then the, the bone marrow uh, examined and uh, the, the, the diagnosis was uh, uh, done uh, uh, on the bone marrow. And this was, uh, this was interesting because we didn't know whether there was a bone marrow uh, pathology uh, before, uh, before we examine uh, the, the longer cell histiocytosis lesion by NGS. And then the, so, in this particular case of these patients, where did the LCH lesions, where did they present? What, what organ system or what on, organ system? On uh, the bone, bone involvement, uh, most, most um, particularly, actually. Both, both, of the, oh. both of the cases were involved uh, in both, both the, 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 both the siblings are uh, having bone marrow involvement. Okay, they both had bone marrow involvement at both LCH and they also had myeloid neoplasms developing and you discovered simultaneously by NGS. Um, it's also, again, it could, be, it could be various mutations arising at, again, single cell studies that, would, that are in like the non-LCH, which is also a new hot area, it could be very interesting in this regard. Um, as far as figuring out cell origin, uh, because where, where, uh, what, uh, what cell, at uh, what point in hematopoiesis, and what cells we, we uh, what cells the um, SXO, the, the uh, I think it's a SF3B1 mutation and, and lipo mutation up here, um, uh, the MPL mutation up here, and then what mutations uh, 
uh, LCH. What did that? What was the, what was the LCH mutation? Did you did they find a, a, a the class BRAF, of virus? BRAF? Class, cl classic BRAF uh, six hundred e mutation. Yeah, so it's it's very possible that, that they're rising at different a different point different. Uh, Stem cells are different different stages of hematopoiesis, like one could have or being arising in the stem cell and the hematopoietic stem cell, which is where we we know most myeloid disorders seem to arise, especially uh, like uh, well, uh, MPN MDSs, like a uh, CMML um, or, or MDS, and then the other one could be arising at a later stage of hematopoiesis in another progenitor, uh, the BRAF. And so single cell studies would be a, a way, and single cell RNA sequencing studies would be an interesting way to evaluate that bone marrow uh, of these yeah. patients further, as far as at what cell what cell origin uh, the mutations are rising. Because you can have them rising simultaneously at just different stages of um, the different stages of hematopoiesis, uh, in which the mutations manifest and, and lead to it, and lead to, 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 to distinct clinical phenotypes. Or it could be a similar cell of origin um, if we find that BRAF is at an early stage of the BRAF mutation is found also, like at the stem cell level, in the same in the same early uh, like stem cell as as a three B one and MIPL. But those again, we don't know predisposition syndromes at this point in time, and those are definitely interesting areas for and and further importance for single cell studies in this area as well as uh, uh, further germline predisposition syndrome studies as well in in ECD and other history of neoplasts. It's a very interesting case. Thank you for sharing it with us and allow I'll yield to others what their opinions may be about this. Thank you. Looks like there are, there are a couple of uh, uh, comments in the chat that kind of um, um, relate to that and it sounds like other people have found number of um, uh, putative gene alterations um, that that could be of interest. And if you can see Dr. Alfasi's uh, chat, but that's uh, looks like there's uh, some contact information. Um, you know, I think as these diseases are diagnosed um, more reproducibly, we probably will see more patients who have multiple. Uh, neoplasms and and Matt, I don't know whether you've noticed that as as well. Yeah, um, I, I I think the general point is that it, it's important to do uh, in the older adults, especially a, a good hematological workup. Um, and even you know, uh, it's easy to do a myeloid NGS panel. That's kind of part of the workup, I guess. But also, we've had a couple of cases where um, that have confused the pathologists. Um, so, uh, for example, a, a non-specific histocytic infiltration of the skin, um, which was just, uh, you know, and it came as a non-Langerhans cell histocytosis, turned out to be a, an underlying angioimmunoblastic lymphoma. So I think it, it, you have to be vigilant for the fact that Histocytic infiltration is is occur occurs in many different yeah. conditions, and I, I think that's part of the reason that these disorders have remained so mysterious for for decades. Is that the pathology can be quite non-specific, and we're seeing the other side of the coin now. We think we've got histocytosis, but we have to be vigilant that there's not a T cell process sometimes underneath driving it. Um, and um, you know, uh, similarly, myeloid malignancy, you know, it's well known that can infiltrate the skin and potentially other other sites as well. So we have to be we have to be nice to our pathologists and uh, give them all the clinical information and make sure that we do a full workup so that so that we we're, we're not kind of uh, we're not we're not misleading them, basically. And I can recall a time where I had to practically uh, 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 squeeze the, the admission from Dr. Rosai that that you could see uh, Rosai dwarfman morphology in the setting of of V cell lymphomas and yeah, he grudgingly admitted that it might not always be a distinct uh, yeah. clinical presentation. Um, um, there was a question about uh, classification. Four of might be able to, to help with in terms of. Um, Placing these in in the myeloid neoplasms, um, and uh, I don't know, Gaurav, I don't know if you can see the question. Oh, I think they're asking is that patient specifically one is Neval Oskaya's question. Is that one you're talking about? Uh, yeah, I think they're asking how would you classify 
to Dr. Kuzu, how would you classify the myeloid neoplasm? I'm oh, asking was the bone marrow hypercellular right. or hypocellular for that patient? Yeah. And there is a comment about LCH and TAR syndrome, actually, which I don't know what, the, what TAR syndrome is. It has been described in the literature. I think they're pertaining to the particular case here. Um, but one of the things I would definitely say is, you know, we are learning in institutional and national at least in registry studies, you know, out of all these three, only LCH is the one that is reportable in the US to registry. Um, and population-based analysis is showing that um, second malignancies are very common uh, in LCH. And, you know, we are, we are working on, the, um, on, on, on some further analysis of that. And, you know, AML and ALL, uh, both are quite common, uh, both in pediatric as well as uh, adult onset LCH. So I have to be very vigilant uh, when monitoring patients. Um, you know, she, the thing, you're not done with just diagnosing LCH, like Matt was saying, or just seeing histiocytes. So seeing the full picture. And a lot of them actually have concurrent. And they have, this have been reported in other studies as well, concurrent as well as prior malignancies. Um, and with LCH, it gets a little more complicated in adults, um, especially because there is concomitant smoking in a larger subset of those patients. So you have to be vigilant. So it connects to the survivorship angle uh, and the long-term outcomes and late mortality. Um, so, so that's something to keep in mind. And, and I, I think um, following from that, I think survivorship really is a it's going to be a big issue with the disease as we have uh, therapies that are, are effective but have toxicities, as, as Eli uh, mentioned in the stopping uh, study. And, and one thing I didn't quite appreciate from the uh, from your study, Eli, is, is what drove the uh, decision to stop, whether it was achievement of CR or near CR, the patient being tired of, of treatment, um, how how homogeneous was that? So in the patients in the cobimetinib trial, the study was designed that after a year of treatment, they had the option to remain on study off treatment. So to be observed still on protocol and get rechallenged if they um, if they relapsed. So that was a number of patients who stopped within the within the rubric of a protocol. Um, and then others, some were for toxicity. Some were for my my this concept of mine of the chemotherapy, and then um, others. There was a couple who changed insurance and simply lost access. Yeah, it's a it's a sort of a, a real world and it was and it's a very real world look. Uh, yeah, re process. reasons people stop. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that there's a way to do this more objectively? You know, and I'd be interested in. Hearing what other members of the panel think um, using NGS assays, you know, the I think the disease that's been most successful from a stopping standpoint and, and recognizing that it's still only about 50% successful is chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, and you know, there, there are I think relatively well established parameters for stopping that are partly molecular. Uh, molecularly based. And, you know, even there, we only have about a 50% success rate in, in stopping. You know, is there, are there molecular tests that we could do that might make us feel more comfortable about doing that? You know, whether it's circulating tumor DNA or PET scans, what do, you, what do people think uh, would be enough to make them want to stop? In the absence of toxicity, um, I would I, I would say a co combination of uh, perhaps, uh, of course, clinical examination, PET, and MRI of the affected organ, and 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 also uh, uh, the uh, blood. Uh, VAF. I mean, the, the circulating uh, uh, mutation. If 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 you can find and 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 like what was done uh, with uh, cell-free DNA uh, in in for for BRAF, but now you can do it with MAP2K1 also. And so, 
I'm sure to, to maybe not at every center, but if you if you if you can try to have a like sort of a disease activity score with a combined uh, index, it could it could probably help. But it's 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 difficult because it's just so proteiform disease with um, so it's it's. I think the, the physician uh, global assessment is still quite important in, in the decision to treat, stop treating and, and, and switch uh, therapy. But I think one of the things um, what I think Mark you're alluding to is the minimal residual disease equivalent in the in histiocytosis management that can guide us in some way like CML, you know, uh, so I don't think we have one right now. Um, I think there are studies being done. There was something presented at the Histiocyte Society meeting recently, looking at further subsets of um, of cells, um, you know, in T cells and uh, even even in lymphocytes, showing that BRAF mutation may be acquired at a later point of time. So I would say right now we don't have something that's ready for prime time. You know, there are studies being done looking at cell-free DNA assays and, you know, further subsetting um, of, of cells and see if there is a functional sort of some marker of cure or something that can get us to a point where we can say there is sustained remission. And the second question is, can we consolidate in some way when you get to that uh, minimal low level of disease? And, uh, you know, that that is an open question and has been an interest um, to, to look into further, um, you know, how can we how can we achieve like a, a cure um, without treatment or a sustained remission without treatment? Um, so, you know, I don't know what others um, experiences and I'm sure others have research going on in that that area to examine it. So can I, can I just ask a question because I. Uh, I, I'm puzzled about the DNA level in ECD. We, we only looked at a few patients a while ago and we've been slow to look at this, but I had the feeling that it was quite different to the uh, picture that you see in pediatric LCH, which is very clear cut um, uh, in that, you know, if you've got multi-system disease, you have a high level of alleles and single site, you have none. Um, and I, I wonder, just a general question, if there's more of a contribution of, of selfie DNA from kind of um, the, the, the burden of diseased tissue that's kind of leaking into the blood rather than, I, I, I don't know, Julian was kind of implying that there is, um, you, know, you can do this and, and uh, sorry, I, I don't know, there's, there's something been published in, in ECD showing that DNA level is, correlates with disease activity have I missed it and should we be yeah. doing this or are we doing it no it's just um uh some of the studies that have been done uh a couple of years ago with the cell-free DNA uh that went down and when you decide to stop treatment like the love study we didn't correlate that with the cell-free DNA but yeah, uh, nice. Uh, like the study that Eli did recently. Probably, if you if you combine that with cell-free DNA, uh, I think it could give some good indication. Yeah. Okay. So I think as a community, we need to do this, don't we? Uh, <laughs> lots of nodding. So Eli, sorry, you haven't you haven't done it recently, no. have you? So Eli? no, I mean yeah. our our blood urine study we showed that you know the cell free DNA being positive or negative was concordant with tumor status, you yeah, know what I mean, okay. with, with genotype, and that the, the allele burden decreased with treatment. However, within positive allele fraction in the blood with disease phenotype and burden of disease, we did not look at. Yeah. And um, casually, I have not seen such a thing at all. Okay. I mean, it's, it's variation within a very low number. So I, 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 yeah. I don't think, I haven't seen that. I can tell you though that the, the in my this I didn't present this, but the BRAF patients who relapsed were all on zero when I stopped them, uh, and mm. they all became positive in advance of the radiologic. Yeah. So, so I think I, I think that that hints it might be different to LCH. Then you put them on treatment, the alleles go away, 
Well, we, we did one patient with a sort of neurohistio presentation and, and the blood did clear as the disease burden went down and it, it felt like a different pattern to LCH. And Daniel raises the, uh, the point that um, uh, you should not forget the experience of uh, interferon in, um, uh, in, the, in the myeloproliferative neoplasms and in CLL and CML. And um, you know, there may be maybe other opportunities, uh, although they do come at, at some price um, anyway. Um, Jesse, how are we doing on time? Doing okay. Uh, we, we can actually stop there on questions. And we have up next, we had several of our international care centers create a video to <laughs> tell us about the state of things in their country. Uh, they're actually very interesting. So I hope that you all stay on to listen to them. We're gonna show them, um, there's five total videos. There's China, Brazil, Israel, uh, the, United, the UK and Italy are all going to uh, touch base with us on, on how things are going. So thank you to the panel. If, if you wanna stay on, you can, that'd be great. Yeah, we really appreciate you networking and collaborating so well together. It's always great to see you guys together. Great. Well, thanks for hosting us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Xin Xin Cao. I'm a hematologist at the Peking Union Medical College Hospital in China. Uh, now we had uh, eight, 80 patients of ECD. What uh, 350 L dot LCH and uh, about 70 to 80 patients of Rosé Dorfman disease and 10 uh, histocytic sarcoma. Yeah. Oh, I, I think the most uh, challenges is the, the, the most difficult one is the diagnosis, since some of the uh, Histocytosis is hard. It's very hard to diagnose, especially for pathologists, uh, uh, since ECD or RDD don't have some special markers like CD1 alpha in LCH. So diagnosis is really challenge. Uh, actually, I think some uh, if uh, sometimes if uh, I meet some difficulty patients, I will talk uh, or have the next, uh, email with the physicians. Some of them are in this, uh, in this family. And also I will talk to my mentors. They will help me to treating or to select the treatment choice. Yeah. I think the NGS will help us to enhance the services since, uh, is it, since more than 50% ECD patients had be rough, be rough uh, with 600A mutation, but some of uh, them don't. And uh, if the be rough well type patients really need the NGS test, and also other adult hist histocytosis, uh, both, uh, most of them don't have be rough with 600A mutation, but maybe they had other mutations. So. So NGS is really helpful, yeah. Okay, uh, now we had uh, three ongoing clinical trials. Uh, one is low dose RSC for LDAP LCH patients, the, the newly diagnosed one, and the one for relapsed and refractory LCH, we use the TCD, salidomide, cytoformide and dexamethasone for relapsed and refractory adult LCH patients. And we also used uh, RD, uh, lenalidomide and dexamethasone for Rosidopman disease. This is, these are three ongoing clinical trials. And we'll, we'll start three clinical trials in a few months. Uh, one is BRAF inhibitor, one is uh, MEK inhibitor, and one is ERK inhibitor, all from Chinese company, yeah. Okay, uh, I think uh, uh, adult histo is a 
uh, uh, rare disease. So uh, it's very difficult for all of us. Uh, thank you for you guys to be together. Thank you. My name is Dr. Uh, Munir. I'm a hematology consultant working at St. James's Hospital in Leeds, um, uh, Yorkshire, UK. So in total, we have got um, and nearly about 70 to 80 patients with a different histiocytic disorder. Uh, I would say that the majority of our patients are either ECD or uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis with few residual Dorfmans and few other rare histiocytic disorders. So um, we treated roughly about um, 70 to 80 patients in our center in different, um, at different time points. So I think that the biggest challenge that we find um, in treating patients is, is first of all, um, meeting the expectation of the patient is quite important. Uh, in my view, because when they are coming to see us, um, they expect that we would know everything about the disease and also uh, the journey that the patients have gone through. There's a lot of patients with rare diseases. It takes nearly one and a half to two years to get to a final diagnosis. And once the diagnosis is there, there is this cloud of um, uncertainty. Um, so one of the biggest challenges for us is to get the diagnosis right, especially in this disease where sometimes it is uh, difficult to get a tissue diagnosis. But with the advent of PET-CT scans, as well as our ability to check for molecular markers such as BRAF mutation and MAP kinase mutation, RAS mutations, we're able to get uh, down to the diagnosis uh, for the patients um, now in a reasonable uh, time frame. I think once we've got the diagnosis, the next challenge that we've got is how to manage these patients, because um, a lot of the data in rare diseases is very sparse and similar. Same is true about uh, a Dianchester disease or Langerhans cell histocytosis. But when we have got the um, molecular changes that we're seeing in the tumors, it's the access to the drugs, which is one of the dip most difficult things for us in, um, in the NHS um, care system. So I think there are lots of resources that could uh, one can utilize. So it's, uh, uh, we always direct our patients to go to the, um, uh, the Alliance group, the ECD Alliance group, and then Histia UK is a very good charity um, by which, uh, on which there is a lot of information available as well. Um, and then um, I think what we like to do is to collaborate with our colleagues in UK and uh, we discuss all our patients amongst ourselves on a multidisciplinary team meeting and the difficult cases we will then take to the national multidisciplinary team meeting which happens every two weeks and uh, myself or one of my colleagues will be the part of that core um, MDT team and we try to decide um, what is the best treatment for our patient? And then uh, obviously discussing with our colleagues on that meeting who have also got experience in manage, managing histiocytosis. We have got an interesting bunch at that, in, at that meeting because we um, are a group of pediatricians as well as adult hematologists. So we like to share our experience and I think that helps us a lot. Um, I think um, the, the, if, um, anybody is working in healthcare systems, uh, all the healthcare systems are very stretched at the moment. And um, for example, um, we are working in an environment where actually um, none of my time um, is being, which I dedicate to histiocytosis, is being paid um, uh, work at all. It's mostly um, what we like to do. And this is a passion that we've got to treat our patients with um, because uh, we understand how difficult it is to treat a patient with histiocytosis. So definitely um, uh, if we have some um, funding stream which is coming um, to um, fund our services, then that would be very, very useful. Um, and we are trying now to establish that um, with uh, funding approvals with, from NHS. So 
The other thing is about the nursing support side of things. It's very well said that we do manage our patients um, in the clinic, but it's the aftercare where uh, a lot of other questions arise. And if we have got dedicated nurses who just deal with histiocytosis patients, who understand the disease well, who understand the problems of the patients well, then we can uh, better provide the care to our patients. And lastly, I think um, clinical trials are extremely important in this space. Um, and um, uh, a kind of a, um, engagement with the pharma to kind of develop new targets and develop new treatments for our patients is, is, is really needed. So at the moment, um, uh, the research projects that um, our labs are looking at is looking at the, whether we can um, extract DNA um, uh, from a technique called cell-free DNA and trying to optimize how best we can uh, and how quickly we can get the diagnosis in our patients. Um, secondly, we're looking at um, biomarkers and other things um, which will help us to ascertain how well the treatments are working. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, we are uh, looking at our uh, accumulated data over time to see how effective our strategy is to treat our patients with histiocytosis over time. Um, at the moment, the therapeutically active uh, clinical trials are scarce, primarily because of the COVID situation at this moment in time. But um, we are hoping that once we um, get national funding for uh, this disease, these diseases, then we are able to invigorate uh, research projects uh, throughout the UK, not only in Leeds. Um, all I would say is that um, it is an extremely rare disease and um, if you find a patient uh, which is which we, we suspect histiocytosis, please speak to one of us or you can refer to one of our histiocytosis colleagues um, in, um, who, who attend the national MGT, um, which might be close to you. Um, so I think I would say that um, it is a rare disorder. It's better to speak to somebody who's dealt with this disease um, sooner rather than later. Uh, my name is Dr. Wayne Zor. I'm currently heading the clinic uh, of histiocytic neoplasms at the Institute of Hematology and Oncology uh, at the Suda Medical Center in Tel Aviv, Israel. So actually, we are, we are facing a tremendous flux of patients. Just back when we started, we had one to four patients in the first year of operation, and currently, we are treating a cohort of, I believe, currently more than 70 patients, which are both the core cohort, which are treated, which is treated in in-house, as well as satellite patients in other medical centers that consult with us uh, uh, and co-treat their patients with us. I should add that these include uh, patients with Erlheim Chester's disease, lung and histiocytosis. Rosai Dorfman's disease, mixed histiocytosis, and, and malignant histiocytosis. There are four fundamental challenges when managing patients uh, with histiocytosis. The first, the first challenge would be to establish a correct diagnosis. We know today that there are many histiocytosis subtypes that may overlap, uh, so achieving a, a correct and accurate diagnosis is key to determining the future roadmap for this particular patient. So this is, this is the first challenge, establishing the diagnosis. The second challenge on our part is mapping uh, the global disease burden of the patient, understanding what are the different involvement sites and to this end, utilizing state-of-the-art imaging technology in order to, to identify all these, all these loci, all these disease involvement sites. And once we have this assessment, vis-a-vis -vis we have a diagnosis and we have a, a accurate knowledge of all the disease involvement sites, we move on to the, which is molecular diagnosis, uh, identifying the mutation which serves as the primary driver for this disease and tailoring a, a, an appropriate treatment accordingly. And the fourth challenge is, is the long-term challenge. This is the therapeutic roadmap in which we have to follow up the patient, see that the treatment provides uh, the best clinical outcome, 
together with acceptable toxicity, and that overall we can improve both prognosis and both quality of life uh, for our patients. So this is this is how we this is how we frame this question, this this challenge. I think that the, the major asset of this community is the ECDGA, no doubt about it. The Eldheim Chester Global Alliance that was able to bring together uh, physicians uh, and researchers from all over the world, put them together in one room annually, generate fruitful collaborations, a, a create a network of a, a network of a, a excellence centers a, and, and an easygoing professional environment in which clinicians from all over the world can consult with centers that have tremendous experience. So this really makes a change. This is, this is I think, the heart of the community, and this translates directly to superior patient care. I currently think that we are able to provide a one-stop shop a solution that encompasses everything the patient needs in terms of, of clinical care in our service. Uh, and in terms of the larger picture, uh, the scientific collaboration and the clinical consults, the international tumor board that, uh, uh, that is available to us, well, gives us everything we need. The clinic, the histiocytosis clinic, as well as the Institute of Hematology in Asuta, uh, is affiliated to several universities in Israel. And as such, uh, it was fortunate for us to have the opportunity to open a molecular laboratory in which we can investigate questions in basic science uh, relating, to, relating to these diseases, to, to histiocytosis in adults. And we have PhD students currently performing their graduate work on this disease. And specifically, they are looking at molecules called microRNAs or MIRs. Uh, these molecules might provide a, a means to evaluate response to therapy or disease burden on the level of the blood. Using, using a simple uh, blood-based assay instead of, um, instead of an imaging assay, of an, of, of an elaborate imaging assay like PET-CT. So, so this is the current focus. And above the translational relevance of this research, we are also trying to use our knowledge, our techniques acquired in the lab to better understand the pathophysiology of this, of this disease how these cells work on the cellular level, on the molecular level, what are the levels of uh, uh, regulation that cause this disease to manifest in one way or another. So we are very oriented uh, uh, to a basic science angle rather than a translational angle at this particular moment. But as I said before, we will, of course, continue to open a clinical trial unit in the, in the future. We are always happy to collaborate. Uh, we believe that in the field of rare diseases, collaboration, sharing data, sharing sample is the only way to move forward. Um, my email is in the ECDGA website, and I'm always happy to help and to receive help. I'm Francesco Pegoraro. I'm resident in pediatrics at Mayer Children's Hospital in Florence, Italy. And I, I, I'm Augusto Vaglio, I'm a, an Associate Professor of Nephrology at the University of Florence, and uh, I also work here at the Mayor Hospital in Florence. It's uh, the, the, the cohort of adult patients includes about 50 patients with ECD, uh, some of whom have also have a overlap ECD LCH. Uh, and there is also a cohort of patients with ALS with pure LCH, uh, which is followed by a, a, a colleague of ours, and that includes about 100 patients. We think that the, the most, well, of course, uh, patients with ECD um, pose multiple challenges, but uh, the one that really uh, is harder for us to, to confront with is the is, uh, neurological involvement, uh, neurological and psychological involvement, because uh, of course, neurological disability is very, uh, it's hard to manage. Yeah, it's hard to manage for patients, families, but also for us. 
and uh, we also always uh, we often confront with patients who really suffer from the disease not only in terms of physical uh, uh, physical discomfort but also in terms of the psychological discomfort and this makes them very hard to to relate uh, with because they they became anxious they became uh, uh, worried for many many issues and they require a lot a lot of attention and and this is sometimes hard to manage when outpatients uh, clinics I think that all of these things are really helpful. So disseminating knowledge on ECD is essential because it raises awareness uh, among different types of specialists uh, that range from, that include uh, radiologists or uh, internal medicine specialists, uh, hematologists, oncologists, and so on. Um, creating a sort of uh, interactive group, multidisciplinary group of, uh, of experts within a hospital is essential uh, because it's very rare that you that it, that you have a specialist with expertise on that disease. Uh, therefore, it's uh, it takes quite a long time, but but it it is essential to have some some reference people in the different specialists in the different specialties uh, and. Uh, uh, I think that that is quite crucial uh, among the specialists, the role of the pathologist, uh, because the differential diagnosis is really in the hands of the pathologist and also the radiologist. I think these are key uh, figures in the management and in diagnosing uh, and following ECD. That's very hard to answer. <laughs> but, uh, I think uh, uh, the support can be uh, to assist them um, with, um, with drug delivery, uh, with, with access to drugs, first of all, with access to uh, imaging studies like uh, CT, MRI or PET scans. So we would like our patients to have a sort of privileged uh, pathway, path to uh, get these exams uh, because they, they have a, a huge amount of things to do, of exams, of, of routine, uh, of imaging studies uh, to undergo. And therefore, we think they should be uh, facilitated in, in, in every possible way. So access to diagnostic procedures, access to imaging studies, and access to drugs. OK, we are, we are um, uh, coordinating a series on pediatric patients with ECD. Uh, uh, recruitment is still ongoing. We are uh, collecting uh, quite significant amount of patients by now, and we're trying to expand it uh, even more to, to really be able to, to give some answers in terms of differences uh, of organ involvement, response to treatment, long-term outcome. Uh, we also uh, are in the middle of a genetic study on ECD patients, uh, we performed a genome-wide association study, which gave us uh, quite good results. We found genetic significance in three loci. Uh, and we are now trying to uh, expand this study with epigenome and gene association analysis to, to understand the significance of this uh, identified uh, loci. Uh, we also uh, we are also trying to understand if uh, periodic uh, short suspension of targeted treatments are feasible in patients who achieve a, a response to to targeted treatments, and this is uh, made to especially for those patients who have significant and uh, and uh, annoying side effects from this category of drugs. Uh, and finally, we're, we're trying to explore, uh, because we, we had a few patients with this uh, particular uh, phenotype, the, the association between uh, ECD with uh, somatic mutation uh, 
and uh, other neoplasms which harbor the same mutation found in ECD, for example, melanoma or uh, thyroid cancer or other type of neoplasms. Uh, to understand uh, if there is uh, maybe a biological um, explanation for uh, this um, quite uh, unexpected finding we, we had in, in a few patients. Uh, for, <clears throat> for our colleagues, uh, I think uh, the most uh, um, important thing to do is to uh, participate to um, uh, ECD networks um, because I, I, I really um, gained a lot in, in, uh, in attending the, the symposia or the meetings organized uh, by this international ECD network. And I think it's, it is essential for um, two main reasons. The first is because we can uh, do collaborative studies. The second is because we really improve our knowledge on the disease and we uh, exchange um, the experience on, uh, on diagnosis, management of these patients, so forth. Uh, I think for such uh, a rare disease, it's, uh, it is really essential to work together and it's not just words, you know, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really important to create a network and uh, this enables you to do, to do many different things that you would never be able to do by yourself. My name is Andre Abdo. I am a hematologist and work in a public health system on Hospital das Clinicas of São Paulo University and in a private health system at uh, Cancer Center in Hospital Alemão Oswaldo Cruz. The both institutions that I work, uh, probably we have treated or saw maybe approximately 35 to 40 patients with TCD and probably up to 60 or 65 or 70 patients with all the histio uh, disorders. Uh, I'm talking about adults only because uh, I mostly see adults. I just advise some, I uh, advise some, some, some physicians, physicians treating uh, pediatric uh, patients, but I, I do not see pediatric patients. We have a lot of challenges here in Brazil. Um, the first is the difference that we have between the, uh, the public health system and the private health system. They are different in a lot of points, but the most important, I think, is the treatment. Because in the, pub the public health system, I, am, I can only offer those treatments that are uh, approved by the the, by the government. So I cannot ask for anything else outside what government has, uh, has decided. And of course, in orphan diseases, we have almost nothing. So we ha I, have to, uh, I have to adapt treatments of other diseases like, uh, for example, chem chemotherapy like cladribine, and citarabine for other disease to treat ECD patients, for example, because we don't have BRF inhibitors in in uh, public health system, and I, uh, we, as a an employee of the public health system, uh, it's very difficult to me to go under justice and ask for this for this treatment. So the, it's very different from the the private setting where I, where I can, if the insurance didn't approve. Uh, do not approve the treatment, I just go under justice and I, I have treatment. I have recently, uh, uh, have, I have won my first trametinib patient uh, treatment uh, under justice, of course, but it was in a private setting. So, but uh, I work in a, in, a, in a huge public institution. So it's a little bit different also uh, along the, the public institutions in Brazil. In my institution, I can offer patients all the diagnostic tools. I have very good hemopathologist. I have the molecular, uh, uh, for example, BRF status. I can perform the BRF status on, on, on my biopsies. And I have uh, uh, 
I have MRI, I have uh, I have PET CT, I have scintillography, I have everything that I need to 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 uh, make the uh, the complete uh, evaluation of the patient. But uh, so we have this problem in, in treating on treating patients in the public health system. In the private health system, we have everything since the since the 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 diagnostic tools and of course the treatment. So uh, my my challenge uh, is, I think it's the first challenge when we have different scenarios in the same country. But the other uh, challenge that I have is to uh, expand our knowledge of issue disorders and expand the awareness of issue disorders to my, to my other colleagues here in Brazil we don't have capacity to absorb all the patients in the country. We don't have this capacity. So I have, we, we must have colleagues that are able to do what we do. So we are very, uh, uh, we are tr trying to do a very hard job now on um, uh, expanding the information and make uh, medical uh, advisory. And um, so, there are two challenges. They are the, the biggest, but uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of others. But I think these uh, these two challenges are the, the most important. First, the, the big difference between the two scenarios of uh, public and um, private settings, and the second one is the uh, unfortunately in 2021 we have probably most of the doctors have never heard about histo disorders. So we're trying to, to perform this medical education. I think the resources that we need now is, uh, is first try to, uh, of course, uh, you have done a lot, like having the, your website in a Portuguese version, version because it's very important to our patients because most of them don't speak in English or can read in English. So, uh, but uh, we have to bring knowledge to the patients, but we have to bring to the education to the medical community. And that we really, in this pandemic uh, catastrophe, we have some good points. The first one of them is this online setting now that can make us go everywhere. So I think this is a very good opportunity to us to to expand our um, our knowledge and make better uh, medical education. So it's probably uh, very important to try to to uh, create uh, lectures and having, uh, for example, uh, the uh, the most important physicians you know on the city that you know all of them. So it would be very important to have, for example, Eli talking to us or Julia, what improvements we have to, to search for. I think the most important is the uh, better uh, molecular uh, studies. We need to uh, get this more um, available and because we have, for example, we have BRF in status, but I, cannot do NGS for uh, a lot of other mutations. And so I, I kindly ask help for other uh, physicians, for example, Professor, Professor Emil from France. But uh, I think it, uh, the molecular uh, featurings of uh, and, and, and how to, how to uh, uh, make a complete uh, molecular analysis, I think it's, it's a challenge for us. Because what, even if you have, for example, you can pay for your your test, there is not a lot of uh, labs in Brazil that are able to perform everything that we really need to understand all the molecular features of the of the disease. And some in some cases we have very challenging diseases. We have uh, we have overlap between uh, Rosa Dorfman and and ECD or ECD in uh, LHL. So. It, we need molecular uh, better. Uh, we need better understanding of the molecular level. So I think this is one of the the the, uh, the, the main challenges for us 
and there's a, a lot of room to improvement here. I think in the near future, we are probably uh, getting better, but these days uh, when I need this, uh, this very deep molecular analysis, I have to kindly ask for our, uh, our, uh, our friends, our physicians uh, outside Brazil. So I really would like to sponsors, to, to pharma, to everyone who is here, me, please, uh, we are completely open to clinical trials. We have patients. Uh, we, we need clinical trials here. So please, if you are listening to me, uh, contact me. If, uh, Brazil has some, some regulatory problems, but we are improving and we have patients. I think this is the, the most difficult thing to have that, uh, but uh, we are very open if anyone is interested in, in on offering a new therapy or even to, uh, for example, if we could use uh, MAC inhibitors, uh, for example, in, the, in our public health system it was, was a very important thing to us because I cannot use them in this scenario. So in a clinical trial, for example, that would be the opportunity to this patient to, for this patient to use and probably is the only uh, possibility. Para, os, para todos os pacientes, contem conosco, contem com, com, uh, com tudo que a gente pode oferecer e para os colegas médicos, uh, nossa equipe e eu fico completamente uh, aberto para discussão ajuda e agradeço a todos os pacientes, a todos os colegas e especialmente a Aliança Global por tudo que tem feito uh, e por todo, toda a melhora que nós tivemos nesses últimos cinco anos na, no tratamento das doenças idiocíticas. Muito obrigado. I have said that uh, um, thank you for all, all patients and also thank you for their doctors also that Get, got connected with me. And so I would like to, to thank all of them and also the Global Alliance because nothing was possible until we met you. And it was a very, uh, very good time for improvement since we met. So these five years and six years, it, everything, a lot of things have changed here in Brazil. Of course, we have a lot of things to improve, but I think we have done a good job. Well, I, if whoever's still with us, thank you for attending. And we look forward to seeing you at our next meeting in April uh, 2022. We will be going to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, because hosting with Dr. Go and Dr. Goyle there. We're very excited about an in-person event. Uh, and of course, we have the backup plan. If we need to go virtual, we'll go virtual. So you will be getting an email with the recording of these sessions. You'll get a survey to uh, let us know how our first virtual meeting went. And you will get information about the clinical trials that are open for ECD patients. And lastly, we have a pathology guide that we just had created with a team of pathologists and doctors that have um, helped to put it together. It's a, a fantastic guide for pathologists. We uh, urge you and we, we encourage you to share that with your teams uh, and colleagues at, uh, at your centers. So thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, we hope that you've learned something and uh, had some good takeaways from the meeting today. So thank you very much.